What's up, guys? Cam versus Cam, eh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mistaken that that's not me cam that's the other cam
Oh yeah, Mark. Just ripping it up. such a different feeling watching uh, watching the older footage and it's hot dude. it's hot Niagara Falls St. Catharines is hot right now we are muggy and it rained all day yeah yeah I only did one interview this week just cuz need to take some time off just been going hard at it you know I'm trying to keep up and trying to you know trying to do my duty to you know promote as much as we can and you know what the growl does and everything like that but uh you know sometimes man i just i just don't wanna <laughs> Ugh. like again man we're just going through phases through this whole fucking bullshit thing right so you know just trying things out try to keep the mind occupied and everything and again doing lots of bike riding i just gotta get out just gotta get the fuck out it's been nice out like sunny so we've been crushing the crushing the bmx the bmxing all the time and uh, yeah, it's been fun. But like I said, man, I just wanted to do one. Just wanted to do the one interview this week, just because you know I had some other shit I had to do, and, and just not do not do these really. <laughs> so yeah, we got Cam, we got Cam Lee coming up here, and uh, obviously we got some uh, got some pretty rad old school footage there. Good old Joymany, eh? That's cool as shit. Right on, right on. So, uh, so let's hang out and see what, uh, what's going on. Yeah, my brother what's up what's up uh-oh are you, are you listening to on the side yeah let me uh let me take that down let me do that there we go sweet 
sweet. So, uh, wearing a howling shirt. Are you are you a fan? Yeah. Of, you're a big fan of the movie. Oh, of course, of course. Yeah. I love I love the effects in the movie, but I just find it a little slow. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess you could say that. I mean, um, now compared, I'm actually a bigger fan of Howling Two. Believe it or not, what? I like Howling Two. Yeah, <laughs> I like it. As cheesy as it is, it's very cheesy. <laughs> That's and they get cheesier as they go on, though. That's what's even, but you know. Yeah, um, big time. So, what's going on down there? I see you got a little, uh, a little uh, weather going on. Yeah, it's been crazy rain. I guess uh, some kind of hurricane or something came through on the out of, out on the east coast or something, and was it's just pulling a bunch of stuff in. Uh, it started yesterday or last night. And then it really got bad around five o'clock this afternoon. I mean, it was cutting electricity off, uh, on and off, and, and stuff. So hopefully, wow. it's calming down now. I can still hear some thunder rolling in the background, but it, it's it doesn't seem to be so bad as it was. Wow, wow! So we're having a good day today, I'm assuming, and uh, we're uh, we're ready to rock this. So uh, on the uh, on the screen right now is uh, Mr. Cam Lee of. Uh, I don't really have to uh, tell you what he's done or what bands he's been in, but uh, we're going to hang out and uh, pick this guy's brain, uh, obviously about metal, and we're going to get into the horror movies because he's a huge horror buff himself. Uh, and, you know, Mr. H.P. Lovecraft, big fan of that too. And, uh, I mean, it just, it, just, it just goes. I mean, heavy metal, horror fantasy it all just comes together and this guy likes to embrace the dark side of it all so uh so yeah. what got you into uh i guess it's kind of the same story i'm assuming with everybody else uh about the heavier side of of heavy metal you got into venom possessed all that kind of stuff is that how it worked or it goes back even farther uh it goes back farther Matter of fact, I'm in my, my little studio here, and, and I surround myself with the things I love, and uh, uh, I prepared for this, so I, I was hoping you'd ask that question, because um, uh, I actually made, I did an interview a couple months ago uh, with Tony Black, he's in Druid Lord, yeah. and I actually, I actually fucked up and made a mistake, because I was talking, and you know, you're going back in your mind, I'm going back 35 years, and I'm thinking... Okay, what was it? I remember uh, when I was in the record store, I actually flubbed and made mistakes. I came home and I looked at the record that I thought I was talking about, and I said, "Oh fuck, I I, I got the wrong one." Anyways, <laughs> so what 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 it's I I grew up. I'm old, you know. You know, I'm really old. So I started way before the you know, pretty much the, the beginning of the death metal scene, and I, I of course you know. You know, 14, going back when I was 14, 15 years old, I wasn't, I wasn't a metalhead. I was pretty much like anybody starting in the scene at the beginning. I was a little punk rock kid. I was a skate punk, uh, you know, going Sweet. around. And I really got into bands like the Misfits. And, uh, I mean, Walk Among Us was like, it was like my Bible. When I first got into that. I was like, oh, man. And then you get into stuff like Dead Kennedys, you know, you get into stuff. Because you're, you know, Sex Pistols, you're just skating around. And you're listening to what all the other skate punkers listen to. And Ramones and stuff like that. And, you know, we're talking early 80s here. Yeah. Just coming out of this back into the 70s, early 80s. And then, um, so being a punk kid, I adhere to punk. But what was the album that totally, I guess, was that uh, sort of crossover album? And this is long before the crossover thing hit. I got it right here. This was the album that I went to a record store. And this is back when you when you bought vinyl based on the cover. Yep. You, didn't, you didn't even know what it sounded like. You just went into the fucking store and you said, <laughs> you went through the albums, you looked at the cover, and you said, fuck, that looks cool. This is it. Ah. This album, and I still own it to this. This is the one. Plasmatics, Cootie Top. I thought it was Metal Priestess. I actually met and mentioned it was Metal Priestess, but I was wrong. It was this album. This album was... This is this is basically this is my this is my weed. This, this, this was this is my introductory <laughs> drug in here with metal because I wasn't I, back then. I was like you know I had heard metal um, like most people that heard metal the first time they probably heard it on college radio stations and I'm not talking about the pop metal stations. I'm talking about on you know radio stations that were college stations that would play it. I'm talking about coming out of the disco era 
of the 70s, yeah. going from a little kid where you're listening to shit like Disco Duck, and the <laughs> next thing you hear is, I talked about this the other day, I remember hearing on the radio at late at night, they would always play uh, Frankenstein from, uh, and I just remember that riff, dun, 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 and it just, it stuck with me. And I remember that was like the first probably heavy riff I heard. And then I heard on the same radio station, the same college station, I heard War Pigs for the first time. Didn't know it was Black Sabbath. Just knew that, you know, heard the song. And that's back then when you got a you had a cassette player and the radio station would come on and you would just hit yep. record. <laughs> and it was one of those like little teen square separate. So you just put the tape in and hit record and you play, you were playing the radio next to it. Yeah. <laughs> you weren't actually playing the radio through it. So that's how I re recorded stuff, and, and I was introduced to kind of metal in that sort of way. Um, plus, my dad was like, you know, into one of those record pump clubs that would get like, you know, 16 albums for 16 cents a month yeah. or something. Old like Columbia that. House or whatever. <laughs> yeah, and I remember he bought a lot of stuff like, uh, you know, so old stuff from the 60s, like, you know, Hendrix and stuff like that. So that was the rock era stuff that I would kind of like listen to. Actually, I learned how to play drums by listening to Jimi Hendrix. So. Um, I would listen to Jimi Hendrix and play drums to that, and then, of course, you know, I tried to play uh, the, the Misfits when when I, when I basically learned. I, I'm a big, big seven inch fan, and I still collect them today. And uh, I had the uh, London Dungeon uh, Misfits seven inch, which basically had the song London Dungeon, Ghoul's Night Out, and Horror Business. And I used that sort of like my staple, my blueprint Bible when I first learned what play, play drums, because that's like. I played that, put that on, and played that playing drums. And I was a little punk drummer, so, you know. I only had a five-piece kit. I didn't even have double bass back then. You know, it was just a all D beat and just five, you know, basic uh, snare, floor tom, uh, bass drum, and two toms, hi hat, ride, and two cymbals. Right. That was it. And that was that's uh, how I started pretty much. So Misfits, Plasmatics, that's kind of like what got me into it. And then going back to that same record store as we go back in, it just, uh, uh, that's kind of how I met Rick, met Rick in school and, uh, got to talking about stuff, met him in art class, actually. Um, he, he, I was drawing some skeletons one day and he brought over Iron Maiden Killers album and he said, Hey, can you draw this? And I was like, yeah, I could draw it. And I drew, you know, Eddie form. And then he kind of was like, just started talking. He says, Hey man, you ever want to listen to this stuff? And this was back in the day when people would bring vinyl to school. Yeah. They bring vinyl to school because it was kind of like a badge. Like you bring your new vinyls to school. And I remember a lot of a lot of the the rocker kids would like do that. But see, I came from I grew up in a school where it was kind of like you had like those little clicks and because I was a punk rocker, I was like in a really small click over here in the corner with there was like the nerds and then these three or four skate punks that I hung out with and everybody <laughs> else was just like either kind of like into Leonard Skinner and stuff like that, Rutch. And then there was a couple of pothead metalheads that were kind of like around that were listening to stuff. And it was weird back then because it was like they'd listen to Maiden, uh, Ozzy, because, you know, Blizzard Oz just came out. So it'd be like Maiden, Blizzard Oz, Ozzy, uh, maybe the first Dio. And, but then they would also listen to stuff like Boston and Foreigner and weird stuff like that. So right. it's like, what? <laughs> okay. So it was weird. <laughs> And then I met Rick. Rick was the only guy that was like listening to stuff that wasn't on the radio. He, would, he introduced me to stuff like, you know, Motorhead. He said, hey, man, if you like this punk stuff, you might like this. And he introduced me to Motorhead and Anvil. And we discovered Venom together basically at the record store. We were, I was, and like I said, this is the day where you would go through vinyl and you just thumb through it and look at album covers yep. and just basically say, hey, this looks cool. Let me try this out. Yeah. Um, and it was cool back then. You have with that record store, that particular record store would let you put headphones on and spin the record. Oh wow! And to listen to it, if you wanted to buy it. Right. And we right. didn't have to go buy it. It was a pretty cool uh, record store. And um, I remember we got. Uh, I listened to. It was a toss up between that that Plasmatics album and Welcome to Hell. And uh, yeah, I was th thumbing through, and I basically was like, hmm. I had the Plasmatics in my hand. And I picked up the Welcome to Hell, and I said, you know, I'm going to try this. I put the Plasmatics back, and uh, I brought the Welcome to Hell home and uh, went to – I didn't really have a good stereo. I had what I have still to the to this day because I, I grew up poor. I grew up with those, like, suitcase stereos. Oh, yeah. Yep. You know? 
Yeah, yeah, I didn't have a really good stereo. Rick was the one with the really good stereo, so I had to go hang out at his house so I could hear the records on a really good stereo. And uh, basically bought the Venom and went back and listened to it, was freaking out over it. And I remember going back and forth to the record store and telling the guy, if you have anything else like this, let us know. And he just brought out stuff like every week we'd go in, he'd bring us stuff. He'd see us come in, he'd go, hey, man, I got something for you. And I remember the first things we bought were like uh, Sodom in the Sign of Evil, uh, Destruction, Sentence of Death EP. There was all this stuff. That every time we go in, this guy would have stuff for me. And I was like, oh, cool, cool, cool. And it just, it just kind of like got right. that way, started that way with Rick and I just basically buying vinyl, hanging out on the weekends at his house and listening to it. And, and basically talking about, hey, let's kind of do something like this. Uh, if you want to ever play, you know, try to do something. Rick was in a band at the time, like a rock band. And uh, I was actually trying to do a punk band, um, which was called Invaders from Hell. Pretty original name. But we were really trying to sound like the Misfits. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Sweet. And um, and the thing was that I couldn't, I didn't even have guys that, that would want to play the Misfits. I mean, I was even... You know, this is Central Florida in 1983. Um, nobody was listening to the Misfits. If the, the closest the punks got where I grew up, they were like listening to stuff like The Police. And I was like, that's not punk. <laughs> so the, I was I was like, okay, that, this band I'm trying to do is not really working. Because uh, I wanted to play, you know, Misfits, and they wanted to play something like Synchronicity or The Police or something, or you know, Roxanne or something. I'm like, this is not working. So Rick started talking to me. He said, hey, let's try to do, would you like to try to do something? And one of the main problems was is I had a really asshole of a stepfather with a complete prick. And uh, so it was impossible to like play at my house, even though I was the drummer. Most. So I would have to basically find a place. We couldn't do it at Rick's house because Rick's dad was really into like um, – a lot of uh, building and stuff. So his garage was converted to a workshop. So it was impossible to do it there. So we tried to do it at my house and I would do it in the, between this window from a time we get home from school before my stepdad got home. So I'd have to crunch time, like rehearse and try to write stuff. And I remember the first things we started learning was like um, teacher's pet from Venom. When by that time, black metal could also come out. We bought black metal. So we're learning stuff off of, uh, we learned poison, uh, from Venom, and we were just learning cover songs and then trying to write stuff that kind of sounded like that. And the first couple of Manus songs that got written, Chuck wasn't even involved. I mean, it was just Rick and I in my room before <laughs> Chuck got involved. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, like you said, you you grew up a punk, so you wanted to still have that kind of aesthetic. But then Rick started introducing you to the, you know, like in both of you guys finding the heavier and heavier stuff so man yeah, it was kind of, so yeah, it was together yeah. we kind of found it together like i said rick was rick had known by his bands like anvil and motorhead and we had another friend of ours that we kind of hung out with that was a tape trader which that also got me into tape trading um and he had a lot of stuff that was coming out especially canada he had stuff that was like raven albums um riot um and he was introducing me to stuff like that as well as like stuff from like accept and and uh of, of, you know, of course, uh, you know, stuff that was coming out of New York, which was the overkill demo, which was a huge thing, like a big thing that hit the tape trading underground. The other things that hit the tape trading underground that were huge were like the first what, the Metallica uh, demo with, when, when, uh, when um, shit, I mean, this was like stuff like, we, and how you would get tapes, I remember back in the day, you wouldn't necessarily get always the demo. You would get somebody... Uh, like I had, how I did is I had a couple guys that I traded with in New York, they would do compilation tapes. So they would like put a bunch of stuff on one side of the tape, write it all, handwritten it down, and then a bunch of flip side. Of it. I mean, I've got like stuff that had like early stuff from, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the bands, like, um, well, definitely Merciful Fate, uh, that 7-inch was on there, and Nuns Have No Fun, that was on there. And, like, and we were just getting a lot of stuff coming in weekly because I was started tape trading and had this guy that came from, he moved down from New York and lived uh, in Orlando and went to our school. So it was kind of like me hanging out with Rick on the weekends, me hanging out with this guy and tape trading at the same time. 
And then Monty Connor was like the main guy that we started trading with out of New York. And Monty was running a, 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 he was going to college and he was doing a college radio station up in New York. And that's literally, I mean, Monty was a big, you know, in the early days of, of the underground, uh, Monty Connor was huge in, in helping, especially in America, with the tape trading thing. He was like one. He was like the tape trading guy to go to. And of course, then there was Jim Pedersen, who still is in it now today. Uh, who did I did Comatose uh, Fancying with? Oh. And Jim was a huge and still is big into the metal scene. Was a huge tape trader at the beginning, especially the late '80s, early '90s. Jim really was like crazy for it. And I mean, he was getting demos. He, he had wall to wall room of just demos. It was amazing how much stuff he had. Um, so there was all these guys at the beginning, like I said, Jim and, and Monty Connor. And, you know, as much as I cringe to say his name, Bor Bor, he helped out a lot. I mean, he helped out a lot in the beginning. Um, but um, now he runs Blabbermouth and we all know what. <laughs> I'm not going to talk bad about Blabbermouth. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but he, he really did help out in the beginning, and there was all these guys that really helped out. And the two guys that really helped out, Chuck, that did Deep Team Magazine, was was uh, John Gross and Mark Conrad. Those two guys were also tape traders, and they were big. They were local guys, and um, I really think that those guys don't really get mentioned enough. I never watched the, doc, the Death documentary, so I don't know if they got mentioned at all in it. I have no idea. Right. But they really helped launch Chuck's career. I mean, literally, if, that, if it wasn't for those two guys, you know, doing what they did, which all the connections that they had, taking our rehearsal tapes, every single rehearsal tape that we ever made, not just the garage demos, but every rehearsal tape that we made, John Gross was there. I mean, he taped everything, and he was the guy that was sending it out. If those early death manners things that got turned into bootlegs and a thousand other releases, that's because John Gross was recording those and sending those out in the beginning. Wow, wow. Absolutely. Yeah. Because, I mean, back then, not everybody carried a camera and a tape recorder and all that kind of stuff, so that's pretty impressive that he was sitting there capturing the moment back then, obviously not realizing, you know, the potential of it all. But, yeah, that's fucking, that's, that's really yeah, I, cool. I mean, that's how I, we, we always had that, and I, I took a picture of it recently. I didn't have the actual one. Rick still has it, I believe. I don't have, and see, that's another thing, too. I think people really think I was going to talk bad about Rick or talk bad about Chuck. I'm never going to talk bad. I will always talk good. There was really good things in our past that I still, I appreciate, I acknowledge. Um, we, I mean, these guys were my best friends. You know, so I had really good times with them, and I'll, I'll never talk bad about them. I'll only talk about the good things. And I believe that Rick still has this boombox to this day. I don't think it works, but he has it because it was so sentimental to us. Right. There was this Panasonic uh, boombox, and I, like I said, I recently put a picture on my Facebook. Uh, I found one, and I'm almost bought it, and I'm still thinking about buying one because uh, I saw it on eBay. Um, but it was this Panasonic boombox that had two mics in each corner. It was the only one at the time that in the 80s that came out. So many of our demos were recorded on that Panasonic boombox. Basically putting it in the middle of the floor, playing live and putting a towel over it. Right. That's generally how all those demos were made. <laughs> you had to put the towel on it to dampen the sound because I mean obviously, yeah, yeah. obviously we, tried, we tried it without yeah. the sound and it's awful. All you would get was this hiss. You would yeah. get this loud hiss. But it's if you put the towel on, you took a towel, folded it in half, and layered it over it, and it would drape over the two microphones on each side. There's a microphone on the left and right channel, and it dra draped that towel over. You would get, like, this really cool, smooth sound, like, close enough that you could hear us. So, I mean, of course, now people hear those tapes, and they go, oh, God, they're awful. But no. I was just talking to somebody else about this just last week. There's That's the... The difference between bands like black metal bands now that try to make a, have a bad production and what we were doing back then, we weren't trying to get a bad production. We were trying to get the best production with the least amount of money you could buy <laughs> on, the, on the cheap that we could get. So we weren't trying to get that sound. It's just the sound we got. But here's the thing. That sound now, I prefer much better more than I do all this polished, new, modern 
death metal sound where everything is just clicky studio re- everything's just clean i want that old school heavy sound and like somebody was just mentioning in, in uh, on your comments as as just before we got into the interview that they said i love the demos and i went me too I mean, me too i love the massacre demos <laughs> i I, I love them. I, j- I recently got a rehearsal practice from Mike Borders, who's back in the band, who has a rehearsal from 1986 that he, and no one has. No one has this. He finally gave me a copy of it. I got it on, I got it off the cassette, put it on a CD, and I'm actually thinking about releasing it because it's never been out. Never been out. Mm-hmm. And it was the last rehearsal that Mike Borders did with the band. In 1986, wow. and I'm, I'm so tempted to try to find a way to put it out. Wow, wow! So was that recorded on that Panasonic boombox too? It, it was, yes, it was. <laughs> it was. And we're, the really cool thing is, there's several songs on there that they're unfinished, but they've never been released in any form, in any way. There's stuff that's on there. There's versions of uh, a song called "The Traitor," and there's versions of um, Infestation of Death that has a completely brand new intro and middle part. There's there's versions of songs that people know that we were extending or working on during the time when Mike was in the band that never got released. And they're like, I, when I went back and listened to them, I'm like, holy crap, I fucking can't remember. I can remember this, but it's like it's all coming back to me as I listen to this practice. They're like, I forgot about this, but it's cool listening to it and remembering it. Wow. Well, especially back then. I mean, like you said, that's like 30 plus years ago now going back and like, holy shit, I've totally forgot what the yeah, hell was like, we did. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's, it's like going to the time machine, you know, it's yeah. just like, wow. It, I, you know, it, it's surprising that he held on. He actually has everything. Well, you know, when I, when I got back in contact with him, when we got back to the band, I was surprised at how much stuff he still held on to. I mean, he's got everything from that to me i've moved around and had trash stuff and stuff's got either thrown away or lost or stuff but he had he still has everything he's got the old flyers and i i was like oh man you got to give me copies of those <laughs> i've got to have some especially like ones we play with morbid angel there i mean that's that i i was like you got to give me those flyers those are so cool man i gotta holy, have copies holy shit i mean and and you can only hold on to so much too right i mean Myself, I've moved around a million yeah. times here and there. You try to hold on to it, but unfortunately, things just kind of slip under the cracks too. Yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, I, I've lost, I've lost more than I probably have now, um, <laughs> yeah. as far as that old stuff goes. And now, if I want old stuff, I have to buy it. <laughs> it's like I have to go on eBay and say, "Oh shit, there's something a rehearsal from 1985 or 1986 on a bootleg. I don't have that, so I got." I've contacted people on eBay and say, hey, man, I'm the singer in the band, and I've got, like, yeah, right, so what? Still pay me my 50 bucks. You can have it. Holy It's not like I'm trying to get it for free, but, you know, it's like, hey, I'm the guy in the band. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and what you were saying yeah. about, and what you were saying about the demo stuff, too, it just, there's something about, the you know, everybody in a room recording live at the same time, lo-fi, and... You're just, it's almost just like you're hanging out with a rehearsal. You're not trying to make an album. You're not trying to do all this. You're just trying to record some tunes. But the feel and like what you're trying to, you know, convey with the music, it seems to come out a little better with lo fi garage recordings. Cause I mean, you, 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 you worked hard on trying to, you know, master your songs and, you're just going to record it on whatever you can find so you can hear and feel the passion with a lot of that old demo shit. Yeah, there's, I, there, I think there's just, I mean, you hit it right there when you said passion. There's just a certain feeling, I think, um, when you're doing it that when you make an album, you begin to lose that feeling. And it's almost because it's, it's, I'm, I'm very metaphoric, so you know, excuse me if I start talking about you know metaphors. Nope. But it's like um, it's like stamping out a cookie, you know, because you keep doing it over and over and over and over, and it just becomes so processed, and it's the same thing over and over, and it just like it just like it starts to lose that first 
Because I think one thing when you when you rehearse, especially back then when you did demos for the first time, um, and I'm not talking now it's digital age. Everybody can just record it, bam, it's on a you know just yeah. oh I can just run in here and go on you know Reaper and throw my guitar riff on here and I could just digitally you know change the amp sound. But back then it was just so it was on the fly. A lot of times when you finally got a song recorded. Um, especially in a live situation, it was the first or second time you actually played through the entire song, like as a band. <laughs> so it's like it's you get that fresh sound with everybody's excited about it. And then what happens when you come to a point where you start to make an album, you're like on the 500th time you played the song, yep. or you know, or 50th time you play the song, and it becomes so kind of cookie cutter, and the feeling starts to to be to leave. Yep. Um, and that's why I, I prefer albums, especially like the old punk albums where bands would go in and just live the studio play. Yep. I fucking love it. You know, and those are my favorite kind of albums, you yep. know, listen to the stuff like that. And I actually prefer live albums more so than I do studio albums. Well, yeah, because um, they're they're on stage playing it once through, and even, even if they fuck up, it doesn't matter. It's just them yeah. going hard and raw and just... And with this, with the crowd also getting them amped up, it's usually either faster or more aggressive, that kind of thing too, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's just, it's just something, and it's that feeling. I just, there's, there's a feeling that comes across that you know gets conveyed in a live performance, regardless if it's a live performance recording for an album or a demo or live performance recording. And not all live performances. I mean, you can get to a point where you're playing. I've seen bands that probably been on tour for like six months. And then by the time I get to them, because we're in Florida, they, they come down, they're tired. And you can tell, yeah. you're like, oh, man. Like, I saw a video of you guys when you were in New York three weeks ago. You were kicking ass, but now you're like, lame. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what happens. Like, they get here to Florida. They're like, fuck, man. I had to come all the way here through this state. To get to the middle of the state to play, I still got to go to fucking Miami tomorrow, which is another four hours. I'm tired. Yeah. Every time I talk to fans, they all feel the same way. Then we got to drive all the way back out of the fucking state. <laughs> well, because it gets hotter as yeah. it goes down, right? Yeah, That's the thing. Fails. Everyone's always like, we got to play Miami or Fort Lauderdale last. <laughs> and then to go back home, they got to drive through the whole fucking state again to get the fuck out of here. Jesus. So it's like, yeah. <laughs> well, just because it gets it gets hotter as you go south, right? So everyone's like, yeah. "Yeah, it's nice and cool. I can breathe." And then you know, you get halfway, you get to South Carolina, North Carolina, like, "All right, it's starting to get a little warm." And then you get to yeah, and then okay, now I'm really hot. I can't handle this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they get here. It's the sw I always tell everybody like my 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 when my wife first moved here, and my my mother in law first moved here, they're they're like, "It's always hot." I'm like, "It's a fucking swamp." It's a swamp. It's, you can't. You, I don't care how what you put in it. What you you build a fucking building. You build you know suburbs or whatever. If you throw a rock, you're gonna hit alligators. It's a fucking swamp. And no matter where you go in this fucking joint, it's a fucking swamp. So it doesn't change just because there's a fucking Seven Eleven or a Walmart. You know. You know, two or three years ago, that Walmart was a cow field, which was two or three years or 20 years before that was a swamp, swamp land. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. So you started playing drums. You wanted to play drums. Is that what, is that kind of what you liked at that time, obviously? Yeah, I mean, it, it, I started off playing drums because, um, well, I'm Polynesian. So uh, my dad is in, 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 uh, you know, he was in Polynesian entertainment and stuff like that. I mean, I was going on stage when I was just a little kid. And uh, um, so I was used to it. And um, a lot of, if you've ever seen any kind of a Polynesian show or a, a lot of uh, the music, especially from Tahiti and Fiji and stuff like that, it's very drum yep. orientated and drum based. So I grew up around drums all my life. I, I, I It was just part of my upbringing. The drumming was part of my upbringing and I just felt that I could, you know, adhere to it and play drums really easy. And I just, it was just a simple thing because drums were always in my house. My dad, you know, like he, like I said, he was in the entertainment business. So there was always drums there. And I just started beating on those drums when I was a little kid. And my dad was like, eh, the kid needs a drum kit, a real <laughs> drum kit. So he got me a real drum kit. And it just kind of like integrated that way. It's like, okay, I just went into it that way. But 
I knew by the time that I was in death and madness, and that's why I actually asked, you know, I said, hey, I could probably do the singing as well. I wanted to become a singer. I wanted to become a vocalist, and I felt, well, I'm playing drums, but I can't find any other band that's going to take me as a singer right now, so I'll play drums and, and sing. <laughs> and uh, that's kind of like how it, 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 it got me in that way. So you wanted to be a vocalist on top of being a drummer. Um, is it just because when you started hearing uh, a lot of the, you know, the, the, the underground metal that you were listening to, vo the vocal style was just kind of, it was aggressive in your face and you just needed to punch people out with your vocals? Is that kind of what the feeling was? Yeah, I mean, I, I was, what really got me singing was, and, um, you know, it's, it's been said, like, from Wikipedia to everything that, you know, I, I heard what Tom G. Warrior was doing. That's part of, that's like 25% of, like, the, of, of the story. The fact is, we were, we were emulating uh, Venom a lot. I mean, we were called Mantis, you know, right. when we first started. So we were emulating Venom. So Cronus was a big kind of thing, as well as Lemmy. Um, but what really settled me to say, hey, I could probably play drums and sing is I heard Exciter. Oh. Um, and I remember hearing Exciter and then reading it on the back that the, the singer was the drummer. And I was like, holy fucking shit, if he could do it, I could probably do it. And, and that's literally what made me say, ah, let me try it. <laughs> and that's, that, it was the band Exciter that literally got me to that's basically sweet. say, I'll try drumming and sing it. Why not? Right on. A good old Canadian band, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, it was, it was, yeah. I was getting a lot of Canadian bands. Like I said, I had a treat training friend that was giving me a lot of stuff. So anything from, like I said, Raise, uh, yeah, Ra yep. uh, Raven, um, uh, I'm trying to think. Sacrifice. Well, think, yeah. Raven. Yeah. An exciter. I mean, there was a lot of stuff that was, he was. Infernal he was Majesty. Me, was yeah. Infernal Majesty. Sacrifice. Yep. Uh, I, 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 Voivod's been around for a while too. Oh yeah, Voivod. Here we go though. And speaking of the devil, first thrash album I fucking loved before the San Francisco Bay Area thrash. Even though that stuff was coming out, this was the one. There it is. Right here. Yeah, <laughs> this album right here. Man, and I used to be a pen pal with Robert Benetti. I used to write him. Nice. And and this, but it was before this album. It was their demo. That I was tape trading and, it, and I, when this came out, this was just like this is still the one I bought, and it's got it's got a cut on the corner uh, because the guy at the, the record store sold like uh, this was the copy that was the the play copy. Yeah. I guess they would. Yeah, and he cut. They always cut the corner of the play copy, <laughs> and I was like, I'll take that. It's still in the freaking original bag with everything. Sweet. I was like, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Rob still hangs out in Toronto all the time, and Gus Pin, the, the original drummer too, he's always online, and uh, they just, they're just good dudes, man, we always see them around, so that's fucking awesome, man, that's nice to hear that, uh, you know, yeah. an old schooler like yourself is citing these old school Canadian bands as, you know, the bands that got you well, into... <laughs> And, and you got and, and there's slaughter, man. And oh. you can't forget about them. I mean, here's, here's the thing: a lot of people don't know this. Again, like I said, I didn't see the death documentary, so I have no clue if this was even mentioned in this or not. When finally death, I left death in 1985. Chuck didn't just go straight. Go, I'm gonna go from Florida to California. A lot of people don't even realize that for two or three weeks he moved to Canada. Yep, and was in slaughter. A lot of people don't even know that. Yeah. You know, so he he tried out for slaughter. He was trying out for slaughter. Then he moved back home to Florida for a couple of weeks. Then he went out to California. I mean, there's just there's just like a lot of like misinformation that people don't know that you know. I I guess you know people like us old school people have to tell people, hey man, you just because you read it on Wikipedia doesn't mean that yeah. that's necessarily true. There's really some other parts to that. But, you know, you know, I don't know if it's mentioned, but, you know, he did join Slaughter for a while. He went up, went up to, like I said, he went up to Canada, was in Slaughter for a while, and it didn't work out for whatever reasons. Came home, then moved out to California. And a lot of people think that, you know, you know, that, and this, here's another thing, too. I'm going to, I got to, I'm going through my albums right here. Yeah, yeah. Just to show you. Yeah. 
another and I wanted to talk about the, the, the you know we, we mentioned this I, I mentioned this to you I wanted to talk about the influence of horror movies right. in the early death metal stuff and uh, but I wanted to hold this album up because this album is key man this this right here is one of the key albums um, autopsy um, and bef- you know before um, I'm, I'm brain farting <laughs> before uh the drum, you know, ah, shit, hold on. And of course, I got this one as well. But before oh, Chris yeah. was even, yeah, before Chris was even drumming on, on Scream Bloody Gore, a lot of people don't realize that Chuck had another drummer. Um, they, they kind of think that uh, Death went from having me as the drummer and then, you know, he just moved to California and got Chris in the band. But people forget that Eric uh, was the drummer. Um, there was the drummer Eric in the band. I don't remember Eric's last name, but he was the brother of one of the guys in DRI. Um, oh. As a matter of fact, I think he played on the first DRI album. I uh, can't remember his last name. Oh. Um, but Somebody's going to pipe up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, he was actually the drummer after me in death. Uh, Chuck one moved out to California and got with him at first and did a demo i believe and eric plays on that demo and i believe the songs and i don't even have this demo this is just going going from memory a land of no return is on that demo and song mutilation i believe is on that demo there might be more but i believe that's a song i think eric actually plays on those not chris i could be wrong i thought eric was the one who played on it chris then joined later on to do the scream bloody gore album right and of course Autopsy shortly after that, which obviously it's still going strong today. And and to me, those first two autopsy albums, which I just showed you, I they're they're classics, man. I, they're my favorites. What I have down on the floor right here are my favorite albums, <laughs> my favorite vinyl. Well, and, and um, autopsy was was majorly influenced with the punk rock. Also, you can totally tell with all that. Yeah. 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 So uh, obviously that would be one of your influences coming from uh, you know punk background that autopsy yep. would be up there and especially throwing the horror side of it all to make things more gruesome and deadlier than the whole package. Yeah, that's I mean, and, and that's what I wanted wanted to talk about before was um, there hand hand in hand death metal, especially the early death metal from the eighties and eighties horror. They are bedfellows. If it wasn't for certain horror movies, we wouldn't have the death metal. Or we'd have death metal, but probably not the way that it ended up becoming. And death metal was very, in those early days, I mean, I could literally go down a list of horror movies, probably ten, probably five, really, yeah. and, and give you the, the those horror movies that influenced so many death metal bands. And some, will, some bands will lie. I don't know. I mean, but come on, man. Um, <laughs> when you got bands like Deicide with songs Dead by Dawn, and yep. you do not realize that that comes from Evil Dead 2. Yeah. I mean, come on. <laughs> but, um, I mean, but the key bands like Autopsy. Autopsy, Autopsy was definitely, especially on, especially on Separate Survival. There's so much, you know, there's so much based on, on especially 80s horror. And then, but the, the band, to me, and this predates Scream Bloody Court. This album predates the band. And this this band is essential and key and doesn't get mentioned, I feel, enough uh, today as they should. It's this band right here. Oh, my God. Of course. Of course. Uh, Killjoys, this season of the dead, this predates Scream Bloody Gore, by the way. People don't realize that this came out first. And... Uh, Unfortunately, we lost, you know, Killjoy, yeah. um, you know, a couple of years ago, and it was devastating to me because, you know, he was a friend, and, uh, yeah. but I really feel that, uh, you know, Killjoy's Necrophagia was a very uh, essential in the early death metal bands, mm-hmm. you know, and very influenced by horror. I mean, if you just look at the back right here. The zombie's got a Fangoria shirt on. Yeah. I mean, that tells you right there how important horror was 
to the early death metal scene. And then, you know, death, like when I was writing lyrics about this, everything from the Evil Dead, Evil Dead to, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which was Slaughterhouse to, uh, I mean, just so much stuff of Gates of Hell, which uh, Chuck wrote Regurgitated Guts. But before it was called Regurgitated Guts, there was a song that was a version was called Curse of the Priest, uh, which later Chuck turned into Regurgitated Guts. And that's totally off Fulci. You're wearing a Fulci shirt right now, which is the Gates of Hell. You got it's it. totally off. Yeah, it's yeah, Gates of Hell, or what some people know as Gates of Hell, which is City of the Living Dead. Yes. Um, which is the scene when the girl throws up her intestines. That's Regurgitated Guts is totally just written about that one scene in that movie. And <laughs> That's a great scene, too, though. Holy shit. It, it is. It was, and especially for us, it was staple. And I'll, I'll give you an example. When I first got into to death, or mantis, the, the thing how we celebrated every weekend was something they don't have now, but they might, I'm hearing now since the virus is back, they're going to think about bringing these back, but drive-in movies. Right. And Chuck and I... And Rick celebrated the first time we got together on a Saturday. We got together on a Saturday afternoon, and we all hung out. I brought my drums over to Chuck's garage. We, we set up. We played, you know, messed around, played. And to celebrate, we went out that Saturday night to the drive-in movies to a double feature, and it was The Evil Dead and the movie Nightmare. And Nightmare played first, and then The Evil Dead played second. We were so blown away by seeing The Evil Dead. We came back the next day, Sunday. I stayed the night at Chuck's house. I, le- I slept over there. Rick went home, <laughs> came back the next day, all day Sunday, and we wrote the song Evil Dead. Wow. We were so blown away by that. So, so what, what year was that? Evil, Evil Dead is the first song that we wrote together as a unit. Sweet. As a band, as the first song, myself, Chuck, and Rick wrote together. Other songs that we had, Rick had some parts and Chuck had some parts, and all this ended up being on the Death by Metal demo. Uh, Legion of Doom was Chuck's song. Chuck had it, but Rick had that beginning riff. That that beginning riff, that opening riff was Ch- uh, was Rick's. The rest of the song was Chuck's. Um, Evil Dead was the one that we all wrote together. Uh, I'm trying to remember what else was on that. I, it depends on what version you get. Actually, right. I have the Mantis sitting here. Right? Well, there it <laughs> is. <laughs> um, so, Legion of Doom, Evil Dead, Mantis, Death by Metal, and Power of Darkness was right. the first version of the demo. Um, and so, Evil Dead was what we wrote together. Mantis was a song that Rick had completely all the way through. Uh, Death by Metal was Rick and Chuck's together writing it that day in the garage. And Power of Darkness was Chuck's. Chuck, Chuck had Power of Darkness. So Chuck had Legion of Doom, except for the beginning riff, and Power of Darkness. Evil Dead we wrote together. Manus was Rick's, and Death by Metal. Chuck and Rick had wrote that together really quick. Uh, damn. And uh, that's literally how it all started. It all started with, with, with that demo. And then, of course, there was different versions of that demo that came out. Because literally all that demo was was us rehearsing in the garage. And like I said, John Gross recording that stuff. Um, or Rick recording it, John Gross taking the tape, dubbing the tape, giving the tape back to Rick the next day, and him dub- making dubs of it and, and just sending it out everywhere. Say, throughout the Tape Training Underground. Jeez. Literally, the Tape Training Underground is what started everything. I mean, right. Man, and... Here's the thing too. I talked about. I talked to Speckman about this. Unfortunately, he was really upset at one time because he said he remembered reading in an interview that Chuck didn't acknowledge Death Strike or didn't know who Master was. But I remember riding around in Chuck's car while Chuck played the Death Strike demo. I totally remember that, and I told Paul that. I said, Paul, that's not true. I remember riding around in Chuck's car and him playing the Death Strike demo. I remember that. I distinctly remember the, the nights that he would ride, we'd ride around, because he'd play all kinds of demos in his car on a cassette. And I remember that, and I, I told Paul that. I said, well, unfortunately, I, you know, I don't know that Chuck said that. I didn't see the interview. It's kind of sad that he would say that he didn't know who Death Strike was, but I actually know that he was 
was listening to Death Strike. <laughs> he definitely was listening to Death Strike. So I don't like that whole thing where everyone's like trying to figure out. I hate that. So it's the Bo is saying they started death metal. I hate that. You know, I don't want to even get in that thing. No. Nope. Into that argument. I don't want to go there. It's not one guy started it. It no. kind of came together yep. as a collective of all of us around that time just doing it. No totally. one guy just created it. It isn't just one guy's crown. Yep. You know, everyone has to share that crown, has to share that throne. It's just not up to one guy. So. Well, like you said. Yeah, let's, and like you said, Chuck came in just a little bit after when you and Rick were already jamming. So the influ right. the influence from you guys already jamming obviously influenced Chuck to you know to start you know getting some new ideas and everything because there's some other like minded individuals who wanted to play some heavy shit. Yeah, I mean that's literally it. I mean Chuck had different ideas and de and definitely a different um, influence than than we had. Um, and one thing I'll always say about Chuck is Chuck pushed himself constantly as a musician. I only see people have to realize I only knew Chuck as a teenager and I only knew Chuck for two years. That's it. That was it. That was as far from 1984 to 1985. That's my longevity with Chuck. I didn't know Chuck as a, as a man. I only Chuck, knew Chuck as a teenager, but I will say even as a teenager, he pushed himself. He was very, yeah. very conscious about his guitar playing. Matter of fact, he met other guitar players that were not even in the style of music at the time that were kind of like in the more um, flashy kind of guitar. I mean, you got to remember this was the 80s, so people back then, and I think they were listening to like stuff like George Lynch yeah. and, and, and kind of docking and kind of like totally. trying to play like, like that, and Steve Vai. And, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Joe Satriani. So Chuck would like hang out with guitar players that were kind of in that school of stuff just to kind of uh, learn a lick, you know? Mm -hmm. And then Chuck would try to incorporate that particular lick or his version of that lick in his style, in his way. So even as, as a teenager, I will say that he always pushed himself and to continue to, to uh, further his, his music his skills. I right. mean, that's definitely something that he did. He showed at an early, early stage. And I think that might have been, I'm, I can't speak for Chuck, and I, I'm not definitely going to speak for Rick, but I really think that might have been some of the frustrations that Chuck had maybe with Rick, because Rick would only learn so much, and then he'd be like, that's enough. That's all I need to do. Yeah. Chuck would push him and say, you, you got to you know, let's let's try to bring it up a notch. Yep. You know, let's try to do this. And then Chuck would write riffs that Rick couldn't play, and it would become frustrating. So gotcha. and I think maybe that might have been why there's always a different. You know, I'm not going to make excuses for Chuck. You know, like I said, I only knew him as a teenager, but that might have been reasons why there's such a different changing lineup in all the different incarnations of Death. Yep. Is because maybe he was trying to evolve and go further. And the musicians that he had were were holding him back. Yep. So he he'd always seek forward to look find guys that were going to not keep him at one level that were going to always lift him up to a higher level. So he felt maybe some kind of satisfaction with that. So I think that's why you know she, as as each death album goes along, I feel you know personally I feel after Leprosy they kind of were no longer a death metal band. But that's just my personal. Yeah personal opinion um <laughs> by the time we got the screen buddy you know i'm not screen buddy by the time we got the spiritual healing it still had some of that death metal stuff and of course you know james murphy came in and james murphy elevated gave the guitar you know leads to a, a, a different level but then after that i kind of think it went it's no longer really to me death metal it becomes to a different form yeah. of you know i guess you can call it death metal it's more technical death metal it's not that totally. raw death metal that we started which I kind of adhere to and stuck with. Right. Just because I just like that stuff. <laughs> I like it. The, the, the more ugly, disgusting, <laughs> raw sounds, the more I like it. It's just, that's what I like. That's my punk roots coming out. No, totally, totally. Same same thing, man. I, I, I like the primitive style, the rawness, and everything like that. Um, so you, got, you and Rick ended up moving on and getting your own band together, more or less, after getting out with Chuck? Well, it's it's Chuck. Chuck 
got rid of Rick first. Okay. And I stayed around. And this is another thing a lot of people don't realize. Um, Scott Carlson and Matt Oliva, who are from Repulsion, everyone yep. knows I'm from Repulsion, they were in a band called, um, oh, hold on, uh, Genocide. Right. And after, after uh, Rick was out the second time, after Rick, because he was back in again the third time, uh, for leprosy, but after he was kicked out again the second time, Chuck was telling me he was talking. He's been talking to these guys from Michigan, and he said they're going to come down and they're going to try out for the band. I said, okay, yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Well, they came down, but they didn't bring any equipment with them. They just came down and hung out. And there's a very rare video you can find it on YouTube. It's on YouTube. It's Chuck and I playing. And it, it's, as somebody says, I think the YouTube description says death with Cam Lee. And it's a video. It's horrible condition. It's like way the hell back in this venue. Um, it's actually at a, uh, at a VFW club. We played at VFW. And uh, no one was there. It was a punk show. We were opening for the band Battalion of Saints. Oh, yeah. And it's just me. And, it's just Chuck and I on stage. <laughs> it's just the two of us. And it didn't have a, a setup. Uh, boom mic, they had a straight stand, and uh, Scott Carlson and Matt will switch on and off holding the mic stand for me while I sing. But you can't see it so far away, the, the, the video camera is so far away, you can't really see any details, but it's on YouTube. And uh, that is the last show I played in death. Um, and, I, and speaking of shows in death, I have, I have a funny story to tell you. This is another thing that I guarantee you is not. I should save it for the documentary, but I'm going to tell it right here. All right. A lot of people don't realize that the first show Mantis played ever was at a showbiz pizza, which is like a Chuck E. Cheese pizza. <laughs> yeah. The very first show we played was at a showbiz pizza. We played with animatronics behind us on stage. <laughs> I wish there was camera, but I can tell you who was there. Pete Slate, who was in the band Drew Accord. Yeah. That's the first show he saw us play. He saw us play that show. And, uh, yeah, we played a Chuck E. No, not a Chuck E. Cheese, a Showbiz Pizza, which was like a version of a Chuck E. Cheese. Right. Um, and the reason why is in the 80s, I don't know if, if you're old enough to remember this, and, but you're from Canada, so I don't know. In the States, in the 80s, they had this thing called Youth Clubs. And what it was is like, I, I'm guessing the people from showbiz, I don't know, maybe the president was a was a pedophile. I don't know. <laughs> I have no, They created these things where they had these underage clubs mm-hmm. where they, they, the youths would come in. So like if you were like 14 to 17, right. you could go to this kind of club where they play music for you. Like I said, maybe the owner was a pedophile and he was like seeking out <laughs> young kids. I don't know. But they opened up this idea where they have this youth kind of club that you could go to and that and because we were all underage at the time, we were teenagers. It's the first show that we got. I don't even know how we got the gig, but we got the gig. And I think we just there was people just dumbstruck when we played. And I remember we played all the songs that were on the demo, which is Legion of Doom, Evil Dead, Manus. Uh, Death by Metal, Power of Darkness, and we finished it out with a cover. I totally refused to sing it, and Chuck sang it. I wish, I wish there was a video of this, or something or recording. We did live wire from Motley Crue, oh. and I'll never forget that. I will never forget it, and uh, because Rick and, Rick and Chuck really liked Motley Crue, and they really wanted to play that song, and I'm like, man, I don't want to play. I didn't even have double bass, and I'm like, I did it on the floor tom, and I'm like. I don't want to play this song, but I do it, it as an outro, and we played that as an outro. So we played all the songs off that Mavis demo plus live wire from the crew. So were you guys, were, were, you, were you guys, were you guys throwing out uh, tokens to all the video games during the during the live performance? I don't, I, you know, I, don't, I don't remember. I just remember that people were so shocked that oh. they were just standing there with that whole like, "What the fuck is this?" <laughs> expression on their face, and then. Till we played live wire, and then a couple of chicks kind of got into it. Ah! You know, yeah. the 80s chicks with their hair sticking out like this, and and uh, and then uh, that's that pretty hot. It. I just remember, but I remember after that show, hanging out in the parking lot, and I met Pete and Slate there, and we've been friends ever since. Sweet. So, me yeah. and Pete have been friends for a long time. 
Yeah, man. I drew it. Druid Lord's a great band. It's a fucking great band. Same yeah. with e same with his old Equinox, his old stuff too, right, and everything. Yeah. So. Yeah, e Equinox. Well, a lot of another. That, that's another thing with Pete. A lot of people don't realize. Um, Pete and I were in a band together called Abhorrent Existence. Um, what ha happened was after uh, Massacre split up, and uh, this is this is the early Massacre. But this was before the album, so Massacre was around from '85 to '87. And we split up in 87, of course, right at the end of 87, so the guys could all quit and go do the Leprosy album. Um, and uh, they split up, left me, kind of left me behind. I was like, okay, I don't have a band now. And I just got with Pete. And Pete and I started a band called Abhorrent Existence. And we were, it was Pete, myself, a uh, drummer named Steve, which I can't remember his last name, and Mark Lavania, who ended up being the bass player in, for a while, for, in the band Incubus, not uh, the... Yeah. Famous Incubus, but yeah. Incubus from, yeah. Um, totally. and, and Mark was the bass player. And uh, we were, we never got a demo out, unfortunately. We had songs, we, we played a couple shows, but we never got a chance to actually do a demo. And I don't know if we ever did any recordings, which was really weird. Um, but we never got out and we, we were, you know, we did that for a good year or so until, until Chuck uh, kicked Rick out again. Um, it, out of a out of, uh, death for the third time and then Rick got back in touch with me and said hey man we want to do Massacre again which then we started Massacre which was back then in 1989 right. and into 1990 wow it's wow. got a weird it's, yeah, the band has really got a really weird history it's got a it's got a revolving door history of so many people especially when you get to, to Massacre because uh, Rick wasn't the first guitar player in Massacre Alan West was and Al, yeah, Alan West, who everyone knows from Obituary, he was the first guitar player in Massacre. And uh, I wasn't the first singer. I mean, of course, Massacre was a cover band at the time, but they had another singer um, whose name was Brent. I don't know his last name. And he was he was like one of he was trying to do the, the the more metal, you know, the typical metal of the '80s back then. So kind of like a Bruce Dickinson, you know, kind of thing. And uh, they were a cover band that was doing a lot of Anthrax and Iron Maiden and stuff like that. And I remember when I moved, because I had moved from Orlando, Florida to Tampa, or Sefner, it's actually a suburb of Tampa, uh, to live with my aunt. Um, those guys came over. Alan came over first. Alan found me, tracked me down, and he said, hey, would you like to come over and check out my band? And the first time I hung out with Alan, we didn't, I didn't go over to see the band. I went over to hang out at his house, and he played some riffs for me. Um, and ended up actually being riffs from that ended up being on slowly re rot and um yeah. uh you know just talking about you know hellhammer and selfie frost because we were both big hellhammer and selfie frost fans and uh i actually met someone who liked it and it was that was alan <laughs> west and um because at the time chuck hated hellhammer and selfie frost and rick didn't like them <laughs> neither rick nor chuck liked them so wow. i was like i was all in this corner by myself when we did do I'm the only one that likes this Hellhammer band. Shit. Yeah. <laughs> like, you guys don't like it, man. I fucking love it, but you fucking hate it. Yeah, okay, whatever. You know? So I was like, I was like that guy until I met Alan West. I'm like, oh, you like that band? Cool. I like this band too. So it was kind of like that. And then I I went over. It was funny that I hung out with Alan at first. Then there was a setup where I was supposed to go over and meet the band and hear the band, and Alan didn't show up. I remember that. I went over there. I went to it was Billy Andrews' house. I went to Billy Andrews because it's always at the drummer's house. Yeah. So I went to Billy Andrews' house. It was in his garage. And I met Mike Borders and Billy Andrews, and we were waiting around for Alan to show up. And their other guitar player at the time was JP. He showed up, but he didn't have any equipment, which I kind of thought that was weird. And then it ended up basically just being uh, Billy Andrews and Mike Borders playing a couple of songs for me. So it was just bass and drums. And uh, there was no PA. And they were like, well, we, were, we wanted to kind of hang out and ask you if you'd want to do some vocals and sing for us. And I was like, okay, first things first. If we're if I join this band, it's got to be death metal. So we got to drop those gay ass songs <laughs> i remember saying that and i'm like the, those those cheesy songs that you guys do they gotta be off they're out of they're, they're off that list and they had songs like i don't know i some some bands metal bands that i just didn't 
really lo- I didn't really like that high pitch singing. So anything that was like that at the time, I was like, I'm not doing that. So, uh, and so I told them, I said, you got to be a death metal band. And they were like, uh, all about it. And, um, you know, Slayer was a big thing back then. And, and Andrews was a huge Lombardo fan. He, he loved Dave Lombardo. So Andrews was like, yeah, I can play fast. He was like, yeah. So I was like, oh, yeah, we can play fast. Yeah. But a lot of the songs that started off were, were uh, kind of mid paced So like a lot of those early songs, like, um, uh, well, the first song that, that, that Massacre wrote together was Aggressive Tyrant with me. Um, they had songs like Death and Hell and uh, Infestation of Death and stuff like that. And they were kind of mid-paced songs. And Aggressive Tyrant was the first song that was kind of like, it had that Slayer beat. What, what I call like a Slayer botcher, a, a D beat sort of, you know, totally. kind of thing. And I was, by that time, I was a big Discharge fan. And I still, mm-hmm. even though I wasn't playing drums, I still was like into bands that had drums. So I, I love D beat and Crush Punk. So I was pushing a lot of, hey, man, listen to this Discharge album. Listen to this Discharge album. Listen to this. I kept playing the song over and over again and saying, we got to play like this. We got to play like this. And um, so a lot of the, a lot of punk, early punk is a lot of influence in, in that time for me. And then meeting everybody. And that was cool. That's another thing cool about metal in the early days is everybody had influences from different mm-hmm. places. You know, like Billy Andrews was a big Slayer fan. And um, Borders is kind of like a more, you know, traditional metal fan, but he likes heavy stuff like the Sabbath and stuff like that. And and Rick had this more kind of like uh, Motorhead, you know, kind of style. Everybody just came together. And of course, Alan West has was a very like early, you know, Celtic Frost. I mean, Tom, you could you can definitely hear the Celtic Frost Hellhammer influence in the early obituary stuff. Oh, yeah. So that's Alan's style, and that's where he came from. It was so cool. In any metal back then, and what band, whatever band you're in, whatever band, it's everybody that met. It was like all these minds coming together to make this new stuff, and it was like all these influences coming together. And you made, you mixed it. It was like a, it was like a, it was like the gumbo of metal. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. It's like <laughs> just throw a bunch of different stuff in and just come up with something, and then just. And that's the thing too. I remember when we first started, we weren't thinking we were creating a style. And it's not like they set out saying, oh, we're going to make a style. We're going to call it death metal. Right. It's not like nobody was saying, okay, we're going to, we were just taking what we liked, you know, from Venom, from Slayer, from Canadian, you know, thrash bands, from thrash bands that were coming out, German, you know, thrash bands from, you know, Sodom, all that stuff, all the speed metal stuff, the early thrash stuff, all that stuff, just kind of like taking all that and mixing it together and bam. Just whatever came out, whatever we created was it. But the key thing, and I think this is really what made death metal death metal, is horror movies. Right. I think that really differentiated us from thrash or anything else. I mean, sure, you had bands, and I'll always say that Maiden, basically, even though there was Black Sabbath, even though there was Venom, who was underground, Number of the Beast is literally the album that put Satan on the map. Put Satan and metal. Yeah. Number of the Beast. Because every fucking uh, church station back in the 80s would hold up that album yep. and say, See, yep. I'm telling you, you're going to hell if you listen to this evil music. Yep. Because Satan is right here on the cover. I mean, everybody did that. Yep. Every fucking so it's always Iron Maiden, Number of the Beast. <laughs> and that is literally what brought Satanism big time into metal, I really think. I mean, like I said, even though Sabbath was there, you know, there was other stuff there, that number of the beasts are in me now really kind of it, it stapled it in, especially the, when you saw those videos too, man. I remember those cheesy videos in the 80s when <laughs> those guys were coming out with the rubber mask on and that cheesy video uh, from Number of the Beast. And uh, it's I think it's that, and I think MTV played Run to the Hills like forever. Right. I remember that Run to the Hills video forever being played. <laughs> that old footage, that old black and white footage of some like Indians running and stuff and cowboys and Indians running. I just remember that video every time I turned on MTV. <laughs> so I really think a combination of what was, was basically horror movies, Iron Maiden's, you know, Number of the Beast album, MTV cheesiness, 
and just just and that whole mixture of everything and then early death metal band saying you know i'm gonna turn it up a notch i'm gonna I'm, I'm not gonna write about the fairies and the trees and stuff like that and all this stuff i'm gonna like write about this horrid gory shit that i just got done watching last weekend when i went and fucking read in mundo magic from fucking oh, the blockbuster geez. Jesus. And, and saw this horrible fucking stuff like um, Cannibal Holocaust, which yeah. the band to me, you know, the band to me right here that sunk that in and are kings to me. And my, I'm real good friends with these guys. And this is this right here. This right here. This album right here. For those of you, for those of you who can't see what's on the screen, it's Impetago's Ultimo Mundo Mondo Cannibal. Can Cannibal. Cannibal. Yeah. <laughs> Unbelievable. That those right horror there, fanatics. That album right there is key, and that, and of course, you know what they don't have, because um, I only have it on CD, is Mortician. And that first Mortician, because I mean, you got wait, the reason why. Impetigo was so fucking amazing is they really took it to a point where the music is simple, but Steve, in the combination of those guys, what those guys did, the lyrics and the fucking samples, because the samples are brilliant. Yep. My wife, my wife will always quote the sample from, uh, Oh, shit. <laughs> I'm just brain farted. Um, <laughs> God damn it. It's actually not on this album. That's why I'm like, it's it's on the it's on the next album. Horror, um, Horror of the Zombies. Yes, Horror of the Zombies, which is, I got to try to find it uh, uh, right here. I have the, I have the recording of the Oh, nice. But I work for the street cleaner. Yep. The, the, the sample before that, which is from the movie, which is not a horror movie, by the way, it's just the, um, Deadbeat at Dawn. Yep. She fucking loves. She knows that sample verbatim, and she <laughs> loves to say it. And she'll say it all the time. And I'm like, Do you even know what movie that's from? She's like, No, but I know what album it's from. <laughs> and it's just, yeah. I mean, it's amazing that Impetigo or Impetigo, however you want to say it, yeah. they took that movie and they made that movie greater just because of they using that sample. Yeah. <laughs> and. and I work for the street cleaner. Totally. And, uh, but there's so many, so many great samples that they went through on both their albums that just, it, it just stapled that. And of course, Mortician, you know, took it to the, to the, to the next level of doing that and sampling. But nobody had really sampled stuff prior to the, prior to Mortician and prior to Impedigo. Right. I mean, not into the, to the way that they did it. And that's why I said they're, they're so key to the death metal scene, the early death metal scene. And, and the, and had our gods to this day. There are people that just still worship that band, yep. you know, and which they rightly should, because that band really did start the gore grind. Yes. Uh, you know, you know, they're influenced so much of that, and there's so many bands today, and that that have gone by and got come up that have really, you know, were, were the kids that were influenced by those guys. Yeah. And uh, like, and the same thing. Like, like I was saying, autopsy. Another band, Killjoy and Necrophagia, another band, all, that, all influenced from horror movies. Horror movies lyrically gave us a different aesthetic to adhere to rather than just writing about Satan all the time. Still, there was stuff Satan, Satan was put in there because, you know, you're metal and you want to be dark and evil. But, uh, you know, a, a lot of, you know, early bands went for the thing. And I've always been more keen to bands that are going to write about horror, gore, and stuff like that, than I am uh, bands that are going to sing about, you know, Satan all the time. You know, it's just that totally. Satan to me is kind of cheesy. I, I did it back in the death days. I just never did it. When I got to Massacre, by the time, of course, if everyone knows, by the time I got to Massacre, it was totally Lovecraft. Right. And I still adhere to that today. I mean, I'm just like, because by the time I got to Massacre and I wanted to write, I was reading a hell of a lot. A Lovecraft and early Stephen King, and I was just like, you know, this is really cool if you could kind of. And at that same time, it was still the eighties, and Stuart Gordon had just come out with Reanimator, mm. followed up by From Beyond. I mean, 
I was just blown away by that stuff. Reanimator is still one of my favorite, all-time favorite movies ever. And uh, um, I was just, I was just, that sunk, they just called to me. That was like the thing. Lovecraft was just like, you know, this is so different and weird. And a lot of people still can't read Lovecraft. But I'm, I meet people today, I'm like, you know who Cthulhu is? They go crazy for Cthulhu. I'm like, have you ever read any Lovecraft at all? They're like, no. I just like tentacles. No. <laughs> like, right. it's not just tentacles, but okay. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. <laughs> I just, uh, the cosmic horror really got, got, you know, I gravitated to that because it was like something that I felt was cool at the time. And that's what all of the entire From Beyond album, even though it's not right. evident, and I, you know, this was, like I said, I wrote this when I was pretty much a, a teen and just going into a young adult. So I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And you got to remember that the, the From Beyond came out in 91. A lot of the songs were written in the year 1986, 1987. And there's a lot of missing pieces because there's the songs that are missing from that. But I didn't know it at the time, but I literally was writing a concept album. Um, and it wasn't like I was intending to do that, but it just ended up being lyrically like that. And that's why if you look at From Beyond, you know, take off Corpse Grinder, because Corpse Grinder, you know, was a was a song that we wrote in death that we brought over. But the rest of it, it kind of has like a connection, but it's almost like it's there's pieces missing. And that's because there is. It just, it didn't, all the pieces aren't there. Unfortunately, I never got to do it the way that I wanted to, but I think with From Beyond, uh, the way we did it, we, we got the best of the material that we had at the time. We could have done better with some stuff, but I think because it was such a rush job, coming, I you got to remember, uh, Terry and Billy had just left death uh, after the spiritual healing debauchery, which I guess they toured Europe without Chuck, which I don't even understand that. Yeah. But they did that, and then they decided to come back and it was just a fluke because we had another lineup, which a lot of people might know we have the second coming demo that was out, which was a live demo recorded in the studio. So the ear break, the record company at the time could hear the material. And what had happened was during shortly after we recorded the second coming demo is when Billy and Terry got in touch with Terry, just went ahead and called Earache. He got in touch with Earache and said, hey, we're no longer in death. We'd really like to get back in Massacre. And then Earache had contacted Rick and said, hey, the guy, original guys want to come back and this is how we want it, you know? And it was weird because at the time, Rick was kind of like running the show and I was like, oh, okay, that's kind of okay, sure, uh, whatever, and literally two weeks, and I only had one rehearsal. It was like they came back, and in two weeks after they got home, we, re we ran into the studio to record From Beyond, and I wow. like literally had one shot to go and rehearse with them one time, and by the next time, I was in the studio recording, getting ready to record. Holy I mean, like shit. I said, I wish it had been done, some stuff had been better, but it's a classic album. I'm proud of it, regardless of some of the things that I could nitpick it. And there's some things on there, but everybody, I guess, does that. There's things I could totally just go back, oh, they're really bad. Like, I'd like <laughs> rub my head and go, oh, why do people like that? It's really horrible. But it is a classic album. It was really done raw in the studio. I will say that. It wasn't, it's not very polished. And I think that's what sticks with people right. about it. Um, there's so much negative about it. You know, I don't want to go over the negative stuff. You know, everything from the cover, uh, which was thrown at me at the last minute, to uh, to, to the uh, to the logo being changed, to so much being kind of pulled out from under the rug. It's like, okay, um, you're the singer, but you don't get to decide anything about the band anymore. Kind of stuff that happened to me. So I was like, oh, okay, and uh, that's why I kind of like was there. In human condition, got to that, uh, really felt really like, wow, you're going to pull the rug out from under me again, because Cronus was supposed to come and do Warhead, and he was supposed to play bass, and while he was in the studio, for some reason, he just said, hey, I'm going to sing the song. You don't have to keep my stuff. 
it's just so you so your singer can follow me and then i'm like okay so i just had the rug pulled out from under me again because now cronus sings the song and i'm reduced to doing backups in my own band on the song it literally was like that it wasn't like if they didn't ask me, I was like, hey, Cam, Cronus wants to sing a song. This would be really cool. We think this. No, it was just like he did it. I went into the studio the next day and they're like, oh, he, re- he recorded the vocals of the song. We're keeping it. Mm, thanks for asking me. Cool. I mean, there was that kind of stuff that was going on. It right. was, it's, it's, I don't want to talk bad about stuff, but that's oh. the kind of cheesy shit that was happening. And finally, like in 92, in London, England, the last of the. Uh, the uh, Insanity Over Europe tour, I remember because I still have a shirt, um, I quit. And I said, I'm, I'm done. I quit. I quit the band. The, the first time I quit um, on my own after so many, like they split and went, did leprosy and came back and did this. And then I quit for the first time. And then, uh, yeah, that's what happened. And then, of course, it took a whole another two years before Rick came knocking at my door and said, hey, I got a full new lineup and I got all these new songs that I want you to come sing, um, but we're not going to be death metal. Well, that wasn't right away. I got tricked. They came and first he came and told me about this stuff, which was the stuff to be the Promise album. I went in to do it, had completely different ideas. I was going to make it death metal. Some of the song titles still remain death metal song titles, but got changed. And then I got kind of like, I call it ambushed at one time. I went to the rehearsal and I got sat down. I'm sitting down on the couch and the new two new members and Rick are all standing around me. And Rick is going to lie and tell people, no, that was Cam's idea. That was never my idea. I got totally sat down and said, hey, man, we're not a death metal band. So we want you to write lyrics that aren't about death metal. And we have this idea. And it was horrible. It fucking sucked. And I remember I just went along with it because I'm like, oh, at least I have a band. I'll just go along with it. So you're in that point where you're just like, um, you feel defeated. And you're like, oh, well, at least I'm doing something. And I almost felt like, the, you know, like a bass player, I guess. And you're like, I guess I'm doing something. I'm playing in a band. And I'm just going along with it. And we're in the studio. And I'm halfway recording it. And I'm the watching the engineer and the engineer is just bullshitting and blowing, you know, you know, blowing up Rick's, you know, ideas. Oh, this is great. This is really cool. I think you should try this. Telling me that talking to the speaker is trying it, And I'm going through it and I'm like emotionally dead. I'm like, and thinking, fuck, this sucks. This is fucking awful. And I finally just walked out into the studio, like about, I don't know, maybe three or four days into recording and I just looked at them all sitting there and said, you know what? This isn't Massacre. And I walked out. I walked out. I walked out of the studio. It still took them two years to get that album out. Oh. But, and that was the end of the old days of Massacre for me. Wow. It was like 1994. I walked out of on the Promise album. It was so fucking awful. It was so terrible. I just couldn't take it. I just looked like, this isn't Massacre. I just left. I walked out. Wow. And how they finished it, I have no idea. I have no idea. If you if they they if you can listen to it, I've had people listen to it and say it's a pretty cool album, it's kinda cool. And I said, Well, if you really listen to it, I said, you can tell what parts are me and you can tell what parts aren't me. Because they had somebody else come in and do vocals. Ah. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, like if you're not feeling the band, I mean it's just totally natural that you're not gonna put your all in the studio, especially so why would you even bother? But like you said, though, it's like, you know, at least you're in a band and at least you're kind of yeah. feeling that way, right? Well, I was so sick and tired by that time. I was like, God damn, every fucking band I get into splits up or leaves. And it's like, I didn't, I was like, I don't want them to leave till I finally to the, got to the point where it's like, you know, I can't even do this. I'm going to leave. I just took off. I said, you know, I, so that was the second time I left because I left the first time in 92. Um, when after the, on that tour, and then I, uh, like I said, Rick asked me to come back, and then I went, I went into the studio, and we did that, and, and I was in the studio, and I just said, I'm just not feeling this. This is not, you know, I'm not at all. And I, I mean, I, I didn't just leave. I didn't just quit the band and go home. I quit the band, was so, I was just so over everything. I left the state. <laughs> I was 
like, I'm like, I don't even fucking want to be in, in Orlando anymore. I'm out of here. I took off. I left the state. I went up to live in, uh, with my cousin in Boston. Actually, went Salem. Wow. So I, I moved all the way up to Salem, Massachusetts for a while. I was living up there with my cousin. And uh, so I, I just was totally out of the scene. Everything. It just was so, it's, it's just brought me to a level of disgust where I was like, I don't even want to fucking try to do music anymore. Yep. This is it. And I quit music for a while, for many years, actually, after that, because it was so disappointing. Yep. I mean, nothing could have been more disappointing than that. That's why I still, to this day, talk about I hate that album. I hate that album. People are like, well, you hate it. I'm like, it wasn't death metal, first off, and it's just not Massacre at, at all. And it just was just like, I call it my cold lake. Yeah. You know, I say, <laughs> I call it my cold lake. That is like... Yeah, I'd actually say Cold Lake is better than that album. No. Yeah, that's that's yeah. Hey. I prefer, I would listen to Cold, I would listen to Cherry Orchards over and over again before I listen to any track on that fucking phone. So. <laughs> <coughs> well, and yeah. and and of course that's disheartening because you know music has become your life. You've already been you know. Uh, doing band stuff, playing with Chuck, doing the other bands back in the day, and then yeah. when and then when it gets time to start, like okay, we got a record con, like okay, so how did the record contract come into play then? Well, the okay, that, that's a that's a cool that's a really cool story too. Um, a lot of people, hey, I got something to prove that. Hey, hey. I, I did not set this up; it just happens to be here. <laughs> All right. I got to say this. It, this this circles the story. Perfect. All right. So we're gonna to have to go back. We're gonna we're gonna rewind a little bit. Okay. 1987, Massacre. 1987. Massacre still doesn't have a fucking album out yet. Yeah. We've got plenty of demos out, and the demos are getting circulated throughout the underground like mad. I still talk to these guys today, just to let you know. So this is proof. Anyways, how does it come about? Well, those guys quit in 1987. Those guys, and I mean Rick Ross, Terry Butler and bill andrews hmm. they leave they quit they basically don't even tell me they quit they just leave um they're not practicing there's no more practice i'm not calling guys up they're not answering my calls they're just avoiding me i'm like what's going on i find out that they're doing the leprosy album but this stuff's still getting circulated you know they go out it's 80 88 89 they do the, the whole they do the leprosy album they do the leprosy tour they go out and and they're 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 getting you know fame is pretty pretty well known because then they do they do that uh, the video where uh, ah shit what's it called um, uh, the one that they're that deaths on the video that they're on with with I think Venom's on it and Exodus is on it ah uh, shit well they're they're on that video okay and they they get pretty well known from that video and but in the underground Massacre still got a thing going on well a band comes up out of England, basically, uh, with a singer um, at the time, who basically is, I don't want to say he's aping my style, but I got something right here that kind of proves that. Okay, this band comes out, this album. Hey. And a lot of people don't, a lot of people don't realize that Mark Barney Greenway was on this album. Now you can you probably can't see this, but there's a sticker right here. And I'm gonna read this sticker to you. Do this it. is on the actual album. This is the sticker that is on the album. This sticker says Benediction at last. Let me let me look at it. At last, England's answer to massacre, death metal from the cryptic realms. Rock is dead, pop is dead, thrash. That is my saying. That is literally my that ending. Rock is dead, pop is dead, thrash. I say that that live several times on several tapes, and that album comes out, and it's and it's huge, and they're using Massacre to sell that album. Right. And it's it's I mean it's literally the proofs right there. And of course you know Mark Greenway at the at the early stages was aping my style, was basically taking what I did on and basically immolating me. And um, Morbid Angel had just did a tour in Europe, their first European tour. And 
they got back to they got back to Florida and they were playing their very first show in Florida at Janice Landings and I went out to the show and Dave Vincent comes up to me and he says, Man, you are not gonna believe how huge Massacre is in in Europe. You guys are huge. Or Massacre was huge. So actually it was Dave Vincent that actually came up with the idea at the time because he had just played on the Terrorizer album, he just yeah. played with uh, the Morbid Angel on the Morbid Angel, you know, Ultras of Madness. So Dave Vincent first initiated it by saying, "Hey, let's put Massacre back together. I'll play bass. You do the singing. We'll go get in touch with Rick. Rick's out of the band. Let's just and uh, let's get in contact with my record label, who you know at the time that was Earache. Yeah, yeah they were signed to Earache. So." I have to give props to Dave Vincent. Dave Vincent literally was the one that got in touch with Earache to get the ball rolling. Wow. But the thing is, it didn't turn out. Dave didn't actually, Dave was so involved with Morbid Angel and everything else that it, it, it kind of didn't pan out that way. And believe it or not, at the time, Rick was already out of death and Rick was playing in the Jenna Tortures. Small world. Oh, Dave wow. Vincent, Jenna Tortures. Yeah. yeah. Rick was playing in the Jenna Tortures at the time. And I got back in touch with him. Dave Vincent got in touch with him and said, hey, man, you should really come back and do Massacre. Rick said, okay, but I want to bring the bass player from Jenna Tortures, who at the time was Butch Gonzalez, who actually was the bass player on The Second Coming. Uh -huh. So kind of like how that all came about. But Rick was also friends with Joe Cangelosi at the time, who was the drummer in Whiplash, oh, and who had cool. also played the creator. And Rick was convinced, somehow convinced Joe to move down from New York or New Jersey, wherever he was from, to come down and 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 uh, join Massacre. And it was kind of like just really fast thrown together. Um, oh, wow. But because Dave Vincent initiated it and got us in touch with Digby Pearson at the time, we had still stayed in touch with Digby. And and Rick is like a Rick is like a phone whore. He loves to be on the phone. Back in the day when you'd be on long distance, he loved <laughs> to be on the phone. So Rick was always constantly calling. Digby and talking to him, talking his ear off. And it just got kind of like Dave Vincent was not really pushed out, but he wasn't really, you know, he was just involved, initiated it, but was going to do it, but didn't kind of do it. And Rick brought Butch Gonzalez over. And a lot of the second coming songs that's on that, I don't know if it was material that was going to be the Jenna Tortures material or not, but it was a lot of material that they brought over that they already had. And just when Joe came into the band, Joe kind of brought it up a notch. And then I came in and just did the vocals at the time. But a lot of the vocals, was, they were really zombie-based um, at the time because I was totally just, I, this is before the big zombie thing. So this was, I was just totally into Romero. And I had found one of my favorite, uh, and I got into a, uh, collecting VHSs at the time, I had found one of my favorite VHS uh, zombie movies, which was The Dead Next Door. Oh, and I just fucking yeah. loved that movie so much, and I played it so much, yeah. and I was like, I'm totally influenced by this, and everything on The Second Coming was basically based on that. Oh, that wow. Movie. And The Dead Next yeah. Door, The Dead Next Door is actually the most expensive Super 8 movie ever made. Yep. <laughs> you have to I see it. J.R. Bookwalter... Uh, is the director of that, and he ended up going on to uh, start his uh, video label, uh, Tempe Video, and uh, releasing, like, um, uh, what was that, Robot Ninja, and um, doing all these other oh, yeah. kind of shot-on-video movies from back in the day, but it was all based off of The Dead Next Door, which uh, silently was also produced by uh, Sam Raimi also. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, yeah. I knew that. Yeah. <laughs> And there's, a little, there's a little Evil Dead shout out in it where they're actually watching Evil Dead. Yeah. Yeah. The guy's like, come here, man, you gotta see this chicken get raped by a tree. <laughs> yeah. And everybody, yeah. it's funny too, in that movie too, everybody's last name is a director. Yes. Yeah, there's, so there's Savini, there's Romero, there's Raimi, there's like everybody's. <laughs> it's fucking awesome. Yeah. Great movie, great movie. Yeah. So is this that, that, and, uh, Children shouldn't play with dead things was oh, another one. Love that. Was that. Just like, yeah, yeah. So a lot of a lot of a second coming was totally based on that. Um, <coughs> the people were always that. People were always asking me, "What is the lyrics to Second Coming?" And it's like, you say something about Jesus. I'm like, 
I mean, I think I did it before anybody else did it, but I wrote a song about Jesus being a zombie. I mean, that's literally what that song is about. And it's just like, you know, because I kept thinking, hey, if Jesus comes back for the second coming, I guess he's coming back like a zombie. You know, that, I mean, <laughs> it, it was, I have that weird sense of humor, so that's what that was about. And then there was some, there was song Devouring Hour that was on there, which is totally, totally about, you know, uh, zombies. And, and uh, yeah, I think everything on there other than the last song, which was Psycho Brain Trip, which I think uh, Joe Cancelosi wrote the lyrics to. But that was, a, that was about the movie Psycho. Oh, he wrote sweet. there, so so that that album itself or that demo literally is is um very horror movie influenced. Right. I mean that was one where I said I was going to take my influences from horror movies, but if but what happened was that that, that all those songs got scrapped. Well, other than that, I'm glad that the second coming demo got at least made because the songs are out there. But Eric, when they heard that Billy and and Terry we're going to come back or kind of, you know, we're asking to come back to Manasker. Eric Digby was basically like, you need to get those guys back and you need to do the old songs. And I was like, okay. So it was, and like I said, it was, a, it was a matter of two weeks from the time that phone call came through, the time those guys came back, the time we went to the studio, it was all oh. done within a two week period time period. And oh. it was just like, for me, it was just like, wow, that just, just kind of happened really fast. And like I said, I had one rehearsal with them just to kind of go in and just kind of relearn the old songs. And then good thing I still had, I, I kept notebooks and I still have notebooks to this day. I still have lyrics, which let me show you something really cool. This is like, I got it. It's right here. I'm in my office. Now I wouldn't have this if it wasn't for Mr. Mr. Roz. Rick did, did salvage this. This is in a paper. And I don't think you could see that, what that is, but... That literally is yeah. the original lyrics to Legion of Doom that I wrote back in 1980, probably 83, the end of 83, 84. And it's in this because the paper is so old. And uh, and then the other paper that's in here is more of the Mantis Death lyrics, handwritten. So I keep all my stuff literally wow. from the... To, to, and I still do old school. I still do it old school. I wrote all my, I write all my lyrics, um, which I have a funny story about that in a minute. I, I, I write all my lyrics, or I did write all my lyrics handwritten. Did. Until did. Recent, okay, <laughs> until recently, which I don't know if you saw that. I didn't know if you saw that we post this. Yep. I, I started to say, okay, I don't need to do this hand school, old school you know, I'm getting arthritis and writing stuff <laughs> on hand. I'm just going to catch up to technology of today, and I'm going to fucking put everything on the computer. And I took everything, all the new lyrics, and I put them on a thumb drive. And I was sitting in this chair right here, and I had the thumb drive inside my laptop. I got up to turn around to leave the room, and I tripped over a wire, and I dropped my... The laptop. The laptop is fine, but it fucking fell right on the thumb drive, and the thumb drive shattered. I didn't have any backup, nothing, and all the new massacre lyrics for all the new stuff was on that. Other than half the lyrics, though, I have at least in here, and the other half I have written down that I started their hand right now. But there's a couple songs that I completely lost. I have, uh, I have nothing. I don't uh, even know what happened. And I said, God fucking damn it, the fucking curse is still happening. Why is the curse still <laughs> happening? The master curse continues. Because you have to stay old school. Is. I don't know why. Because like, yeah. you have Great. to stay old school and keep handwriting it. That's exactly what it's telling you. Yeah, that's what, that, that's, after that, I said, you know what, fuck this, I'm going back to handwriting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. God damn. So, obviously, Massacre's back now. Uh, and with a yeah. nice and with a steady lineup now. Well, we have a new yeah we have it's, it's weird how it all happened. Um, uh, we got to go back a couple of years to go yep. back to um, uh, 2017. Um, I'm not even thinking about doing Massacre. And Rick is Rick and Terry and they went and did their version of Massacre, the Back from Beyond version. Yeah. Uh, they were doing that. I don't know what happened. They had a falling out. Um. And, uh, you know, Rick gets in touch with me in 2017, and he says, hey, uh, you know, I, let's bury the hatchet. I'd like to try to do Massacre um, again. 
if you're interested. Actually, that's not how it happened. I, I'm, I'm, I got to go back a little bit. Let me, let me, let me rewind a little bit. Actually, he was in a band called The End. Right. Him and the drummer uh, Mike Mazzanetto and uh, Michael Grimm together. They were together in a band called The End. Now, I had, I wasn't following Massacre. I didn't know they had been split up since 2014. But I didn't know this. I wasn't even following the fucking band. As far as I knew, I was like, I didn't want anything to do it. I would just see people write to me, no massacre, you know, no Camley, no massacre. I'm not going to listen to it, blah, blah, blah. And I, I would just like tell people on Facebook, hey, hey, you know, that's cool, whatever. You can hear, you can have your opinion, but let's let's just try not to bring up that band right now on my social media. Right. And so I was trying to avoid it altogether. But he contacts me. Actually, he didn't contact me. He had Michael Grimm contact me through Facebook. And Michael Grimm contacted me and said, hey, you know, I'm in a band with Rick Ross. Um, we would like to do some massacre songs uh, at a show. Would you be interested to come up on stage and sing those songs? And I, I was like, yeah, sure. I'll do it. No, no problem. That's That would be kind of cool. Yeah. And uh, it went pretty well. They did four songs, they, uh, pretty much, the you know, four songs right off the first part of the album, which was, uh, you know, Dawn of Eternity, Cryptic Realms, uh, Chamber of Ages. And the Bible has it. First, first four songs on the album, and it and it, it, it it was fun. It, it was you know no, there was no attitude. It was fun. It was pretty cool. We and it was really good crowd response here in Melbourne, Florida, when we played. Um, and it went over so well that they kind of asked me to come back. You know, when I come back and do it again, that's still at the end. And I said sure. And then they were having a hard time trying to set up a show, and they said, well, we'd like you to come over and rehearse so we can be tighter. Um, the next time we play it. So I went over for a couple of rehearsals and then about the third or fourth rehearsal, they just started kind of asking me, saying, Hey, would you be interested in doing massacre again? I said, sure. Why not? It's what fans want. I know the fans want it. Rick, you, you want to bury the hatchet. You know, and I knew he talked a lot of shit, but I was ready to say, okay, fine. I'll put that behind me. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm, I'm a grown man. You know, I'm not going to hold this over you. And, and we, you know, started working on it. And then, well, Rick has loves to get attention, so he went ahead and got in touch with more and more over at Blabbermouth, and I told him, dude, the website's called Blabbermouth. You can't be any more. It can't be any more. You know, you don't go to yeah. them. You know, but he went to them, and he's like, well, we got to tell people. I'm like, no, we don't have to tell people. Let's wait. But he went ahead to Blabbermouth and blabbed his mouth, which they turned around and blabbed, and then. The next thing you know, we're getting a lawsuit or a threat to a lawsuit from Eric Reif and Terry Butler saying we can't do Massacre because they own the name. So that put a stop to it. You know, it's like, oh, well, you know, you, you can't do it. We own the name. We own the trademark. You're not allowed to do it. Uh, you got to stop. And we had already started booking shows because uh, – Rick was really fast to book shows. He had, he knew some promoters. He wanted to book some shows over in, in South America and down over in Europe. And uh, so we had these shows booked, um, and we were going to play the Protzen Fest. And we got this big, pretty much cock block on us. Nope, can't do it. Name Wars started. The whole Name Wars thing started. We, we You can't use the name. So we went through this whole thing where – Promoters were actually, it wasn't us, promoters were coming up with name suggestions. They were like, call it Masker Inc., call it Masker X, call it Masker this. I hate every damn suggestion. I was like, I don't want to call it Masker anything. Why don't we just call it something else? One promoter was the one in the process promoter in Germany was the one that suggested Gods of Death. Um, it wasn't like our idea. He just suggested, uh, he's like, well, why don't you call it yourselves just Gods of Death? And I, I thought it had a cool ring to it. I said, okay. It's still a little pretentious, um, but I'll work on a logo and see how that goes. So for a while thereafter, the you know going through the name wars, we we were settling for gods of death, but we just weren't getting booked. You know, nobody wanted to touch us, and unfortunately, that's how the world is when the metal comes to the truth. Is if you've got a name for yourself, and they people want that. Yep. So they wanted Massacre. And I literally had promoters say this to me. They said, if you call it Massacre, we'll book you. But if you call it Cam Lee or if you call it Rick Ross or if you call it Gods of Death, whatever, good luck. They literally were saying that. Wow. Good luck. And it was like, wow, man. You know, thanks for kicking me in the balls, dude. Yeah. You know? All right. Yeah. I mean, literally, well, there was 
promoters overseas that were literally saying that. Um, I'm not gonna throw them under the bus. I'm not gonna tell you who they were, but they were literally saying that. Um, it got to a point where I was like, okay, let me check for real. And I have a, I have a, I have a lawyer who's a great guy, Chip Cox. And there's another story behind that. Um, Chip's been, you know, he's a lawyer for a lot of bands. And if it, if it wasn't for Jeffrey Sasson of Troglodyte, that's who got me in touch with Chip Cox. Nice. And, and because of social media, I, I, I kind of put out there on uh, a Facebook, I said, does anybody know a lawyer? And Jeffrey was like, hey, man, you need to talk to my lawyer, uh, Chip. And Chip has been great ever since. He's been fucking fantastic. And I would suggest to any band out there now, if you're looking for a lawyer, definitely get in contact with Chip Cox. He is fucking bomb. And um, <coughs> Chip, I got in touch with Chip. And Chip was great. He loves to talk on the phone. We're talking on the phone. It, it's really, he loves to talk on the phone, but he will not talk long in an email. And that's what I love about him. He's really straight to the point in an email. He won't give you this bullshit. He's just pretty much like a lawyer. He's going to tell you if it's going to work or if it's not. But he'll talk your ear off on the phone. <laughs> and um, so I'm talking to Chip on the phone. And, he, you know, he's very acquainted with who I am. And kind of small world. I find out that Chip represented Chip one time. And I'm oh, like, wow. really? And I was like, okay, well, what happened with that? He's like, yeah, I'm representing him against Eric. And, you know, I'm not going to get into that, but that was, you know, yep. how it, it kind of like was like, wow, Chip rep rep represented Chip at one time. So he Chip was very familiar with who I was. Oh, okay. And um, he kind of like reached out to me. He goes, did you ever get anything for that Manus? And I'm like, no, man, I never got a damn thing. He goes, did they even ask you? I'm like, no, they didn't ask me shit. He goes, you know, that's against the law. And I went, really? What can we do about that? He's like, well, I know the guy's pretty good at relapse. Let me let me reach out to them and let me find out. And I was like, I hear you. Keep yeah. going. And he's like, I'm going to find out if I can get you some money. And I was like, nah, really? Because... I've been in death metal for 35 fucking years and I've never made any money. I've never even received a royalty check. He's like, let me find out for you. And long story short, he got me my money. And uh, that sunk it for me. Wow. I was like, this dude is my lawyer for life. Wow. Life for life. <laughs> so, he, so um, Chip has been really great. And, and I'm going to bring this up to where, where, we're, where we're at now. Right. It came down to the name thing. And I said, Chip, can you do me a favor? Can you look into it and see if uh, if they're telling the truth about this massacre trademark? So Chip looks into it and takes, you know, about a good, you know, two weeks, yeah. gets back in touch with me, and he says, Hey, man, I got some great news for you, and I got some more not bad news, but you know, some concerning news for you. I said, Okay, let's hear this. He goes, Okay. Let's go with the, the, the concerning news first. And I'm like, sure. He goes, they did register for the trademark for Massacre. I was like, ah, shit. He goes, but it did not go through. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah. He goes, you can't just sign a thing and just register a name. You have to go through all these steps before you can get it. He goes, all they did was sign up for the name. They didn't get it. I'm like, so there's no, it's, it's up for grabs? He's like, yeah. I'm like, oh, well, let's fucking do this. <laughs> let's do it then. I'm like, yeah. Uh, so he initiated it. It's gone through. And it, that's the thing. A trademark doesn't just happen. It doesn't like, you don't go and say, okay, I'm going to go on this website and I want this name. And because massacre is a word, right. it's not easily trademarked. You can't trademark it. You have to kind of like a reason why you're trademarking it. So you got to go through all these like steps. So they registered for it, but they never followed through. So basically their threat was bullshit. Um, because you could go onto the website and look and you can see where they registered for it. But then if you really scroll through, you can see where it goes into it. It never went, it never was processed. Oh, wow. So they, they just registered for it. They, they didn't process it. And then they, they kind of threatened us. So here's the thing. I was trying to get to the announcement that Rick made or Blabbermouth made was on this. I know this it's in my head and I've had it was on in 2017, December 12th, 
was when the article came out on Blabbermouth. In December 16th is when Terry Butler said, you can't use the name, me and Billy own it. Well, I came later to find out that's totally bullshit because it takes six months to register a name because it has to go through all this stuff up to six months. It could take longer, but it could take up to six months for any time that you try to trademark something. It's got to go through all this stuff. And any time in that six month period, if somebody wants to contest it, they have the right to contest it during that six month period. But it still has to be proven that they're going to use it in commerce. Right. And here's the thing. They had no proof of it being used in commerce. I had proof that I was going to use it in commerce. Commerce being I was going to use it as a band and play and actually make merchandise and, and stuff like that and make music and bands. So I won it on that precedent alone. Jeez. And if it, it, it went through. Wow. Because I mean, I didn't, I mean, it's not, I didn't want to be dirty. I didn't want to like say, ah, fuck it on that. Yeah, I got it. But it's just, I went through the steps to make sure that I did it right, that I got it. And then because of Chip, Chip helped me get it and initiated it. And then I followed through. I paid all the fees for it out of my own pocket because it is quite expensive. It's not like cheap. Yeah. It's, it's expensive. There's trademark and name. Mm -hmm. So I paid for it all myself. I got it all trademarked 100% in my name. And then... I said, okay, we're going to bring Oscar back. I wanted to make sure, I didn't want to, I didn't want to go yeah. ahead and say all this stuff and have this build up. I wanted to make sure that I had it done. It was set deal before I even right. announced that we're going to bring Oscar back. When I knew it was finally set and I knew that I had the name, that's when we decided, okay, we're going to bring it back. And we came back. We came back with Rick and Mazet first. And we got Mike Borders, who was the original bass player and who was done the demos. And Mike Borders came back into the band, was more than happy to come back into the band. And he'd been doing, you know, really well in his own business. He owns, he owns, a, he builds houses. So he's pretty well off. He doesn't even have to do this band. He just does it for fun. Because the guy built, he has Borders homes. He builds right. fucking mansions. I mean, not just houses, he builds mansions. Wow. Um, so he's, he's pretty well off. So he does this just for the fun of it. And his wife's a dentist. So oh my they're pretty... Yeah, yeah, they're they're pretty, yeah. they're they're not hurting <laughs> at all. Yeah, so Mike came back, and then you know we went out a couple times with with Rick and with you know Mazzanetto, and I I thought the first show was pretty swell. It was great. It was really well. Um, but as each show progressed, it, unfortunately, things got worse with performance, and I. I look at this now, I, I invested in this and this is a business and I wanted this band yeah. to work. I really wanted this band to work and it was like, I put so much of my own self into this, I can't just let let it, you know, I have to be, I have to approach it as a businessman. Yeah. And I, I, I literally, I didn't go up to Rick and kick him out. I didn't tell him he's kicked out. I tried to basically accommodate him the best I could. Mm -hmm. I said, what is wrong? Why can't you play these songs? You wrote these songs. Why? What are you having a hard time struggling with this? Anybody can go, this is true. Anybody can look at these videos. They're on YouTube now. I'm not trying to talk bad about Rick. I'm yeah. not. But the proof is in the, in the performances. You can go and look at, especially the California Deaf Fest. You can look at uh, um, shows. Some shows look pretty good. The show we played in Texas was amazing. It was awesome. And then we played Germany, and it was just a train wreck. And then we played California, and it was a train wreck. And, you know, when, when you have certain, certain – I'm not going to – like I said, I'm not going to talk bad about anybody, but when you have certain dependencies and you can't – or habits or whatever you want to call it, and you can't get past those habits mm -hmm. to make something work, it becomes a problem. Of course. And all I, I basically said I, – and I still have the emails. I talk to them. I still have every single email that I – because he wouldn't talk, he would he would only message. He would not talk to you on the phone. He would he only would message. And I I, I tried to accommodate him and say, hey man, what can we do? Can we drop some songs? Can we can we do some something? What can we do to accommodate you? And he because I stepped up, he didn't like that. And he didn't want anything to do with. It. He's like, I'm out. I quit. And I'm taking the drummer with me. And I was like, really, man? We have shows booked coming up. You know. 
We're supposed to go to South America. We have shows booked in South America. We have shows booked in Texas. We have this whole run in Texas. We were, unfortunately, we couldn't do the run in Texas because of it. We did South America, but we had to reschedule it. Same thing with Germany. We had to reschedule. We had all these shows last year um, in 2018 that we were, were all supposed to do. Well, actually, this is two years ago. So 2000, the end yeah. of 2018, we were supposed to do all the shows and into 2019. And then what happened was he just quit. He quit. And it kind of left us in a, left me in a bind, me and me in borders. And we rushed really fast to try and find some people. And the first couple of people we had, I'm not talking bad about anybody, but a couple of the drummers that showed up, they didn't even know the material. Ooh. One drummer was lis listening to the songs on his phone, listening to the song before playing it. Oh my God. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, you're coming to a fucking rehearsal for a professional band. You don't know the material there. And there is just, well, I like death metal. I'm like, Hey, I like movies too, but I'm not going to try to fucking make one, man. I'm, like, I'm not, not going to go try to be a director. I mean, that doesn't mean that you, anything when you say, I like death metal. Okay, cool. I mean, uh, I, I'm glad you do, man, but you got to like my death metal. You got to like our songs. Yep. You don't know my songs. And, uh, you know, why are you here? Yep. I'm wasting our time. You know, and I, I mean, it felt like that. So it was really hard to get to find a lineup really fast because I, you got so many different types of people and I, I guess I've got a rumor, you know, the rumors out there that, oh, I'm such an asshole, I'm so hard to get along with, which is, I don't, I don't know why people started that, but I'm, I guess it, I'm, a, I'm an asshole if like I go to a fucking, rehear if, I, if I'm going two hour drive, I'm driving to the drummer to go two hours to try to, to, to basically check him out to see how he's going to do, and he doesn't know the material. I'm not like, you fucking asshole, you fucking made me drop. I don't say that, but I'm like, dude, really? You don't know the material, man. Come on. Yeah. You know, you, you're kind of like wasting our time here. I, I kind of think that's like the nicest way to say anything yeah. without being an asshole. But of course, people will take that, take it the wrong way. They, they get a little butt hurt and stuff like that. So that's what happened. And it got to a point where it's like, oh, man, we have all these shows coming up. What are we going to do? And then it kind of, I kind of thought, hey, I know. At one time, Jeremy Kling and Taylor Nordberg wanted to do a band, and I know these guys through Roga Johansson, who I have many projects with. I play in many bands with Roga, and Roga kind of introduced me to them, you know, two years ago, and uh, they wanted to do a project, and it just kept getting pushed back and pushed back. And I knew at the time Jeremy was playing uh, with Venom Inc. He had just taken over uh, Abaddon. Abaddon left. Venom Inc. and Jeremy was playing, mm -hmm. and I just kind of asked him on Facebook. I said, "Hey, man, would you be interested in playing our massacre?" That's how I kind of like do everything now. I just Facebook everybody. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, that's the great thing about social media. I Facebook everybody now. If it I show up on an album and you're wondering how did Cam Lee end up on that, how those guys get Cam on the album? I usually initiate that. I usually like get up and if I like a band, I'm like, "Hey, man, your fucking band is awesome." If you ever need vocals, let me know. Yeah. And people are like freak out, like, holy shit. I'm like, no, no, you don't have to pay me. I do it for free. Just if you ever got a spot, let me know and I'll just do it. Sweet. And um, so <laughs> majority of times that's what I do. I'll just reach out to somebody. So I just I just reached out to Jeremy. I said, Hey man, would you be would you be interested in playing the map? And we basically were just looking guys to finish out these shows. We weren't really looking, you know, we were we were so desperate, we we're like, holy fuck. And we got we to get these shows booked and, and finished that, that Rick and those guys bailed on us um, because, you know, we, we didn't want to be that band. We didn't want to be the assholes that just canceled. Right. We were trying everything to accommodate every promoter. And the, other than the Texas promoter, everybody else we worked with, we, we followed through. We, we went and did those shows. Of course, then fucking the virus showed up and put a stop to everything. Oh, my but, God. Uh, yeah, I mean, literally... We we had, we done we went to do the German shows they went great and then we went to South America did the uh, did the Lima Peru did Chile those those shows went great and right when we were down to South America I remember coming back and then taking my temperature I didn't really know how bad the virus was at this time and I remember like I'm standing in line to get on the plane and they they kind of pull all of us to go to the side and they take our temperature and I was like what the what is going on and then when I got home. 
I then it, it just kind of like the shit hit the fan. And I was like, man, I'm lucky. And then yeah. as soon as I got home, then then I remember seeing a week or so after that about the Death, Death Angel drummer, you know. And I was like, yeah. holy fuck, man! I I just fucking basically dodged a bullet. Yeah, holy and, and, shit. Yeah, I mean it was crazy. How and then well, we know what the world is now. <laughs> yeah. Totally. So lately, you've been uh, you've been working on the side, just on just numerous projects. Not on, not just massacre, but I mean, you have like the grotesquery. Yeah, you got it goes back. It, it goes back to two thousand seven, really. Um, and you got to remember, I, was, I did deny a fiend. Yeah. Uh, which was uh, my, which Terry Butler came into that, um, and uh, that's another story. <laughs> No, nope. um, um, but um, yeah, I I did denial fiend, and then I I left denial fiend. Um, really found out really you really find out if you're gonna work with people when you hit the road. That's when yep. you find out. That's the truth. So after the denial fiend tour, which whatever, uh, that denial fiend massacre kind of tour we did massacre as well back then without Rick, and um, I came back and I was like I'm out, but I got in touch with Roga and I knew I had known Roga prior to uh, stuff that he did with edge of sanity and um, um, got in touch with a couple people. And I, I kind of saw at this time that this was a time back in 2007, 2008 um, in my space days <laughs> before Facebook. Yep. And I, re I remember there was a lot of recording projects. Everyone was just doing recording projects. They weren't really touring. They were just like, and we're just going to do this band for fun, do this. And that's literally how it started. I just started to roll down. I said, hey, man, let's let, let's do something together. And he's like, oh, yeah, I have all this other stuff I do together, you know, and uh, with other people. I said, that's pretty cool. And um, started off with the first band was Bonar. Yeah. Um, because I really, at the time, I was like, you know, I've loved horror movies all my life that I can remember, even before death metal. And pretty much the only time I really got to do anything that was directly influenced from horror movies was the early Mantis and death stuff. Right. Other than that, I didn't really get to, to explore that with any of the bands that I had done after that. And I was like, I really need a band to have this outlet. Right. And that's what was Bonar, and it was I'm so proud to say that I got Killjoy to be on that album. Oh. He came in and, and he was on that album, and I'm so proud to say. And this is the amazing thing when when Killjoy did it. I played the song for Killjoy. We went down to the studio to record it. He did it in one take. Oh my God! One fucking take. And he said, "I need you to stand in the room with me." I'm like, "Are you sure?" Because it was the vocal booth. He goes, yeah, I want you to stand in here with me. He didn't, he held the mic like he was on live. Oh. He heard the song once. He, I didn't even tell him what to do. He heard the song once. He said, I got it. I know what I'm going to do. Play the song again. One take, he fucking did it with me standing in the room. I have goosebumps just talking about it right Holy now. Holy crap. It was amazing. Fucking amazing. Wow. I'm so cool. Yeah. Well, especially especially Killjoy, man. like you said, man. The guy's like a legend in horror movies, death metal, everything like that. Yeah. That for him just to come in, you guys are recording an album. Yeah, let's try this out, and he comes in one yeah. take. You're just like, okay, all right. I mean, yeah. there's a whole new level. I gotta fucking get up to now almost again. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was just it's, it's amazing. I mean, I played it. I, I knew this. The sample I was using was from was from uh, the New York Ripper. I use that, that famous that new sample, you know, about, you know, uh, you know, when the, when the, the corners talking about, you know, you put the knife up or, you know, yeah. I, I, had to, I had to use that sample <laughs> and it was a song to flesh and skin. And he was like, he heard it and he was like, oh yeah, we're the same mindset. I got it. You know, I got it. And I know what we're talking about. And you know, I was like, fucking, like I said, one take amazing. He just, he heard the song once and just ran it again and just did it all in one take. With me, I was standing there. I was just like, "Holy shit!" Wow. And he was like, "Is that good enough?" I'm like, "Dude, that is fucking amazing." Is it good enough? He, was, he was really humble. He was a very humble guy, and he was yeah. like, "He's like, are you happy with it?" I'm like, "Fuck yes!" I'm like, "I'm fucking yeah, it's great." He goes, "Are you sure?" He's like, "Do it." I'm like, "No, dude, it was fucking amazing. That was great." 
That was amazing. Wow. Yeah. Right on, right yeah. on. So then the projects yeah. just started spilling out after that. Yeah, well, what happened was we did, we did, um, we did the Bonar, and uh, I really wanted, uh, you know, I really wanted to do songs about cannibalism, the whole, everything from Texas Chainsaw Massacre to, you know, uh, make them die slowly, to the hills have eyes, it was just, um, and I even, you know, I even wanted to do newer slasher stuff, so I have a song about, you know, Hatchet Face on there from the movie Hatchet, nice. Adam Green, I knew Adam Green, so I even sent him that song. We, nice. When he, when, uh, we, yeah, we did it, and then, um, so that went so well, and it was so, oh, and Steve was on that as well. Ah. Uh, yeah, first song. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, Steve, I got Steve to do some backups on that, so Steve was on that. And I got uh, Dopey from Mr. Tizo. He's on one of the songs. So I got some fr friends of mine to be on that album. And I was really proud to do that. And then Roga really liked doing it. But Roga kind of stepped down. He, he wrote the songs on it, but he played the bass on it. And we had his friend Ronnie um, do the guitars on it. And Roga was like, you know, I want to play. I want to do a band with you where I play guitars. And we do the whole Lovecraft thing. I said, okay, I'll do that. And then... We did the grotesquerie. Um, there was the coffin born. And I, I just like, we, it just came together so quickly because Rogan really played that Swedish death metal. I, yeah. I told him, I said, let's let's make this totally like the Swedish death metal band. Let's just let's, like, do it. So it's that Swedish death metal style yep. with that American, I guess, you know, massacre-esque vocals. And I just took the whole aesthetics of Lovecraft and Edgar Allan Poe and kind of mixed them together and came out with my own story, Tales of the Coffin Board. And amazingly, that turned out to be a trilogy of, of albums. <laughs> and uh, so we did three albums. They, we, actually, we've done four albums of Grotesquery. Three of them are our concept albums that all kind of go together, the first three albums. And in between all that time, um, Roga wanted to do another project. It's like, hey, man, I really want to tune my guitar. I want to go back to detuning, stay D standard, kind of like when Massacre plays, and play more of a death rash thing. But, but I don't want to tell anybody it's me. I'm like, because I think people are going to get a little mad that we're doing all these bands together. I'm saying, hey, man, do what you want to do, but I'm still going to call myself me. Yeah. And um, so we ended up with the skeletal. And oh, everybody yeah. on the skeletal, and last from Hooded Menace, is actually <laughs> plays leads on the skeletal. But everybody on the skeletal, other than me, used fake names <laughs> because at the, at the time at the time they didn't want to be they're like dude if we do this they're going to think it's everybody it's the entire grotesque lineup right that's literally who's on the skeletal but they all used fake names i didn't i was like hey you guys can do whatever you want i'm still using my name so <laughs> whatever <laughs> so we we did the skeletal together so a lot of projects i've done with roga a lot, you know, everything from Bonar to the Grotesquery to the Skeletal. Um, I, I did, I, I did all those with Roga, and then, um, and then you just get to, you get to this point where you just start meeting everybody that's doing these. Rather than touring bands, they're just doing projects, and right. projects are fun. Some people like touring, and I understand it. I get it. I like touring. Oh well, no. Let me put it to you. I don't like touring. I like performing on stage. Right. The touring part, the hotels, the stinky bus, the the, the, the shitty ass conditions, the crappy food. I hate that part. I hate it. Um, I'm also very germaphobic, so I'm a very clean freak. Um, so especially because of COVID-19, I'm freaking out. Like, how the fuck am I going to get on a plane now? You know, how the fuck am I? I'm already a germaphobe as it is. So um, they need to like invent a bubble. I would wear it like a body condom. I'd wear it, you know, but, but, um, uh, yeah. So I just got to this point where I was just meeting so many people that were doing these recording projects. And I found that these people are on a different fucking level of, uh, because I really had a bad experience in the old days. I mean, a, a lot of, I'm not going to throw names out there, but a lot of people from the, especially, the death metal capital of the world um, have a very kind of pretentious attitude, I guess, um, kind of rock star attitude, and I don't really like that. But I started meeting all these people that do these recording projects, and that's all they were, they were recording projects. I found a different mindset in these people. They weren't about the 
pretentiousness. They weren't about showboating and being rock stars. They were just about making some fucking cool music and getting it out there. And I was like, wow, I like, they don't care about touring and being the fucking rock star darlings and being on the cover of some fucking magazine or some website. They just want to get their music out there. They want to have fun. They want to just play fucking, you know, death metal and great music and create stuff and not really care about the tour. Some guys don't want to tour at all. Some guys can't tour because maybe health problems or something like that. But still, there was all these guys that were recording artists and I found this whole kind of niche just started pretty much probably about around 2008 and it's kind of like grown ever since then right. and a lot of us all around the world know each other it's like and we're working together with each other and we're you know um i mean even you you did stuff with with aaron and the guys in cropsy maniac i mean you know aaron and, yeah i mean those guys are fucking amazing yeah aaron's a fantastic guitar player aaron helped me out on the first my solo thing. Aaron was the guitar player on my solo thing. Then Aaron did so well in that. I asked him, Hey man, would you, could you play outside of your box? Could you do some funeral doom? Cause I've always wanted to do this funeral doom stuff. And he came up with the active artist stuff, him and Travis both. Yeah. And you know, I mean, so we've done that and I do, I've do done and worked with so many great musicians that are just these recording studio session musicians. And yeah, they're not problem. I, um, <laughs> I, I, I met Johnny pretty much through Roga and everybody else. And Roga had a, well, I guess Johnny had a project that he wanted to do and he approached Roga at first. And Roga's like, you know, aesthetically, that sounds like something Cam would do. And then Johnny got in touch with me through Facebook and he said, hey, this is what I'd like to do. And um, I said, dude, that's right up my alley. And we got to talking on Facebook. <laughs> and we didn't know what we're gonna, we didn't know what we we're gonna call it. We we're just like talking on Facebook, you know, f- you know, doing exactly what we're doing right now, you know, live and and, and basically uh, phone conversation. And it all came together so fast because he was like, "Hi, I kind of want to write, you know, I, I want you to write this fantasy story." He really liked the, the grotesquery, what I'd done with the grotesquery, which was with a concept album. And he said, would you want to do something like that? And I said, well, I'm not going to do the Lovecraft thing. I've already done that. And I do that with so many of my other bands now. Um, but I, I do have sort of this thing that I want to do that's not really horror-based. It's more fantasy-based. And I said, ironically, it's kind of like based in Norse legends and, and, and Swedish, you know, and, and Scandinavian legends. Yeah. And then I just, but I didn't know what we were going to, like, sing about or what it was going to be based about just talking together he kind of like started telling me this story from his childhood that his grandmother used to tell him about this not robin or this night raven that would come at night and steal children's intestines and i was like that is fucking brutal that is the brutalest thing i've ever heard somebody tell a fucking child if you don't go to bed this black lady raven is gonna come and eat your guts and i was like <laughs> that's the fucking brutalest thing i've ever heard and how come no one has ever talked written a song about it and i guess it pecks your eyes out too and i was like god damn that's fucking it's chill it's pecking the eyes of children out it's eating children's intestines how come i've never heard of this thing and how come nobody's ever i'm like i gotta write about this thing and then he told me the name i'm like we gotta use that for the name of the band and that's literally how it came about. Right on. It literally came a conversation, <laughs> and, and it just it just it just flowed like that. Jeez. And I went into I went into super overdrive, reading every fucking Scandinavian legend possible that had anything to do with ravens and crows and, and corvids of any kind, and just I came up with my own kind of like fantasy storyline based on on it and created my own legend and it comes with a story inside of it and everything and just it works so well with the music that he had for it that it just it was just it was synchronicity yeah. it just flowed perfectly that's a it good like, yeah Damn. it's a great album man and there's a lot of lyrics on that album too yeah thanks and with it, there's there's <laughs> we're working on a second one now i mean i have yeah. literally a, a novella a novel you know miniature novel written for the second part um and, you know, Johnny still wants to work on the music and, and 
and uh, he sent me some music that was demo music, you know, the early stuff. Yep. Stage them, and it's it's amazing. I can't get really excited to do a second album wow. follow up for it. Wow! Right on, right on. So yeah, so you've been having fun again, like you said. There's a there's a whole different kind of niche of people that are hungry. But like you said, you know they they don't want to they don't want to have to tour. They don't want to have to deal with stuff. They just kind of like some bedroom projects. But you're hooking up with you know cool people that you've like you said you've known for years on end, but could never do a project because I mean you know just uh, different countries and stuff. But now with the, the age of the internet and everybody's got a pretty cool home studio and stuff, all these ideas are just coming out. So you're just like you're hungry again. Yeah, it's 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 literally it's it's that. I mean, there was people who I I've known for years. Matter of fact, this, I have a, I have a new project. I can't even. I want to tell you about it. <laughs> I want to tell you about it, but I can't be right now because because we're waiting for that. You know, we're waiting. You know, and anticipating the whole press release. We have a new we have a new song that we just demoed. It's getting mixed right now. Um, I will tell you that. I can tell you this much. I, I, you're going to hear it first right now on the growl. Um, yeah, um, I'll tell you this much. The, the Two of the guys in the band, now this is, I'm kind of stepping outside because mostly everything I've done, I've done with within death metal, you know, mm -hmm. um, aesthetics. This time I'm kind of stepping not too far out. Like, I'm not going to go do disco, but um, <laughs> I am... I am uh, working with some very well-known uh, uh, black metal artists, and they're not Norwegian. I'll let you know. So it's, I'm not like j jumping on a Norway kind of trip here. Yeah. I've already worked with with Norwegians and Swedes right now that are awesome in, in the death metal stuff I do. So, but I've known one of these guys for fuck a long time. I mean, years. Matter of fact, uh, this goes back probably to ninety maybe 1990, 91, I've known this individual, and we're finally going to work together, and I'll drop one of the bands that he's worked in as a clue right now. He worked, uh, he played in a band called Anathema, that you, some people might know of. Oh. Um, he played in Anathema, and then he went off to be kind of in a really famous uh, symphonic black metal band, I guess you would call him. Um, so he's kind of well known in, in that, uh, from that band. People are going to know him mostly from that band, but he did play in Anathema. Um, and I'm also playing with another individual that played in that band. So wow. those two guys uh, that played in that, that band, um, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to spill the beans uh, yet, but I mean, don't, I guess don't, don't. it's going to get out eventually, but I mean, yeah. uh, I'll, I'll give you the initials of the band. I'll, I'll give you that much. You can guess it. If not, you could, you'll scratch your head and you're probably going, really? But uh, then uh, I, it's a tease, but the initials of the band is COF. So if you can figure out who it is, um, I'm playing with a couple of members that were in that, was in that band. And that's a, kind of a new band. Uh, now cool so um yeah uh it's definitely uh it's definitely different it's outside of stuff i've ever done but it's definitely still heavy and uh i still do the the, the, the death metal type vocals in it so right it's, on. Uh, yeah it's definitely going to be different i think it's going to be something that people are really surprised surprised about so uh, killer and I, I went back to the whole you know lovecraftian lyrics because it just yeah. fit it just fit so oh my um, god so you're busy. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to stay busy, but it's just like it's like trying to trying to stay busy. But I always find that I'm bored. I don't know. What I, I, I know that's that's bad, and I've I've been like that for a couple of years now. I, I've done so many projects, and I get them done, and I'm like, eh, I'm bored now. Huh. I want to do something new. I want to do something new. And Roga just he's a machine. He just puts them out. Oh my god. Know? I can't do as many bands as Roga does. I can't no. do it. I'm, I'm at my. I think I'm at my limit right now. I mean, <laughs> I, unfortunately, Bonar probably won't have another album. I really wanted to do a third follow-up album, but uh, it just it just doesn't seem like that's because Rogue is really not into it. It just I can't. I don't feel right going forth with that band unless he was a part of it because that's a band we did together. Right. It was the first band we did together. So he wanted to step down from it. And 
he doesn't really want to return to it, and I don't feel right to continue doing that band without him. Right. So we have the Grotesquerie. We, he, actually, I have a brand new Grotesquerie album I need to finish up and work on, um, which would be the fifth album. But that was going to be the final album. I had always envisioned the Grotesquerie just being the three albums. I didn't even really want to do a fourth album. We kind of threw the fourth album together, and now we have a fifth album that we're working on. And I kind of we agreed. We we both agreed that this is it. Once we do this album, it's it. A lot of people say, "Oh, you should never say never," but I. When you get to a point, just like horror movie sequels, there's a time you got to stop because right. it's starting to get a little predictable and a little bit, sure. you know. So I kind of I wanted to stop after the third album. Rogan talked me into a fourth album. We're going to finish up with a fifth album and finally end that. And then Rogan's talking about maybe bringing the skeletal back, which I I would be more than happy to do that. And I had fun with doing that album. That album was really fun to do. So that's like something that I would like to do. Um, I'm working on bringing Akatharta back. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have Aaron return because Aaron is so busy with Cropsy Maniac mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And, and I loved everything that Aaron and Travis did for the first album. But Akatharta was something that before the fucking virus hit and it really stopped everything, I really wanted to go out and tour with a doom band, a funeral doom band. And I really wanted to get members that were going to actually probably be able to go out and tour and do yeah. that. So I started working with an individual who I know from Texas um, on, on stuff that he, he does some pretty heavy stuff. And he kind of like wrote a song for the new Akathar and it was perfect. It was like, this is heavy funeral doom, exactly the kind of stuff that I want to do. Sure. And I'm really big into fish funeral doom, like Forgotten and Warm Phlegm and bands like All from right. Finland that are into that early phase of funeral doom. And I always wanted to, I mean, for years I've been wanting to do funeral doom. So when I got a chance to do Akatharta with Aaron and Travis, it finally was a dream come true. Unfortunately, the label that put that out really didn't push the album. So it kind of just is existing. It's there. And not too many people know about it. And I'm still like, I tell people, I got a funeral doom band. And they're like, what's funeral doom? Jesus. So everybody, uh, where can we, where can we acquire these albums for purchase and everything? Like, can we go, just go through you? Well, I got, yeah, I have a lot of the stuff on Bandcamp. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm sold out of, of all of the grotesquery other than maybe one or two of the CDs of the fourth album, the first albums are gone. I still have plenty of Bonar left. Um, but yeah, I have a Bandcamp site. Uh, it's Camly, you know, on Bandcamp. You can pretty much find it. And, and everything I have available is usually on that. Everything from the Not Robin is on that to uh, the Bonars that I have to the few Akathars that I have left. Uh, I'm out of the skeletal, but it got re-released and I'm waiting. But because, again, the virus... Um, yeah. has shut down certain uh, mail. The the re-release of the skeletal, which looks fucking amazing, even though I haven't touched it in my hands, um, uh, was coming out, out of a, out of Brazil. And because of the virus, they just shut down all mail out of South America. Yeah. So I can't get it. I can't get it because a, a Brazilian label put it out. But Ronda <laughs> and I can get our copies because they just fucking won't allow any mail to come. So right. we're just waiting until they start allowing mail to come before I can get those again. So I have new Skeletal. Well, it's the first Skeletal and the EP re-released on uh, on a new new release. And it, like I said, it looks amazing from what I saw, the pictures of the merch, but I haven't held it in my hand. Wow. Uh, I got... I was... Because I got the rights back to Massacre myself, I've been talking to the people at Earache, so I did get new copies of From Beyond. Um, I have, so I have From Beyond uh, available. Nice. All, the, all the vinyl sold out in the first week. Of course. All the vinyl I have. As soon as I said, I have From Beyond vinyl, I got so many orders. <laughs> and I thank every single one of you people that ordered the fucking vinyl because you fed my family for the month. I actually say it because COVID, the fucking COVID-19 shut, shut us all down. Yep. And I was really relying on touring to bring my money in this, yep. this fucking year. And that just completely shut shit for everybody. Everybody got shut down. So there's a lot of you that bought the vinyl. As soon as I put the vinyl up, 
I want to thank every one of you guys because that's the most sales I ever got from anything yeah. at one single time. And it, it was, it was, it was amazing because literally it, it bought food. It bought food for us for a month because as soon as this got shut down, my wife got laid off because she works at, she worked for a dental office and they'd laid off a lot of dentists off and stuff like that. So she didn't have a job. She got unemployment. But if you guys follow the news, a lot of people were not getting, they were getting denied unemployment. She yeah. was lucky to be one of the ones that got it. Mm. I can't get it because, um, I really, I was self-employed yep. and I was just doing you know, the band stuff. Yep. So you can't really like fill out this thing. What were you doing for money? Ah, uh, well, I was touring. I tried it. I tried to get in touch with the, 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 the unemployment office and show them, Hey, I had all these flyers and stuff and, and emails from promoters saying that, you know, we're cut, we're, we're, you know, we're shutting down the shows where like Ryan, for all the death fest, everything's been like pushed back till next year. Yeah. Trying to show, you know, unemployment. Hey, I'm not working right now. Didn't get it. Got denied. But at least she got it. So everybody that bought, and this is something I want to say to everybody right now. If you're watching and you're you're in in you're a fan of the scene and you've got favorite bands and not just my stuff. You know, I, I, I'm I have my fans and you did great and I appreciate it. If there's bands out there right now. Seriously, right now, if there's bands out there that you love, that you like, and, and, and you want to support, the best thing you could possibly do at this present moment in time is support them by buying their merch. Yeah. Because there's so many of us musicians that are out of work. We're mm -hmm. literally out of work. And I know that a lot of you guys are out of work. Not, this shit fucking put everybody out of work. There's so many, there's like four million or people in the, just the states alone that yeah. apply for unemployment in the past month it's fucking insane so there's a lot of people out of work and i'm, I'm not expecting you to go and like you know buy everybody's merch and and you know yep. go broke yourself and starve yourself but i mean if you can support a band directly by buying merch yep. then please do because there's so many musicians that are out of fucking work right now and who knows maybe some bands might not survive this you might not survive. There's so many people that might fucking. I'm I'm thinking how many people are renting. I'm lucky. I, I'm a house owner, and, but I wasn't. But how many people are out there that are renting right now yep. who can't pay their rent? And I'm thinking, fuck, we already got a homeless problem as it is in the United States, mm -hmm. and you pull this on top of it. I'm hoping that some landlords are going to be cool, but there's some dickhead landlords out there oh, yeah. that just will just evict your ass. Yep. And man, if you happen to be one of those fucking fans right now that's struggling, who, who could possibly be homeless? Of course, you no. Know, I'm not telling you to go out and support a band. If you're about to get kicked out of your house and you don't have rent and you don't know if your landlord's gonna kick you, yes, I'm not talking to you to go out and support a band and buy their merch. I'm talking to the guys that maybe are still working, you're still lucky enough to have a job, you're still, you know, bringing in money yourself, you're comfortable. If you're at that point, but you have, a, you know, a favorite band or somebody, buy a seed, buy a patch. Yeah. Dude, you have no idea how much. If you just buy the smallest thing sometimes that, I don't know, I can't speak for everybody. I mean, so there might be bands out there. So, you, dude, you're cheap. You just bought a fucking patch. No, it's not going to be me. <laughs> but there could be bands out there that are going to appreciate anything that you buy from them. You buy a CD. You buy a patch. You buy a shirt. You buy something from them. Something of their worth. They're, if they're selling the mask, I know some people are like, oh, everybody jumped on the mask thing and started selling masks. Yeah, I did it too because I was like, hey, everyone wants to do it. It's so fucking, I'll do it. And some people bought them. I bought five. I bought five masks. I'm not going to lie. I didn't like buy a bunch of them. I bought five masks. My wife, my wife wanted one. My buddy that helped me, um, you know, Robert Darling, if you're watching, you got one. So I sold three. I literally sold three. They sold out. So I was like, okay, people want a mask. So People have, if 20 years from now, in 2040, somebody can be old and say, I got this in 2020, this massacre mask when COVID-19 was really bad. <laughs> but I'm only one of three people who have this. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I can imagine that's probably sure. what's going to happen. But... Guaranteed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like, but I, I say the same thing too, man. If you can't afford to buy any merch, like, like comment share anything you can just to give yeah. notice to any bands 
uh, movie companies, production companies, like anything. The arts period, man. If you can't help and afford to buy the merch and just do that, at least, you know, like, share, comment, do everything you can to bring this, these projects, these creations to light to let everybody else know what's going on because we're all in the same fucking boat. Yeah, exactly. And there's some of us, I mean, we think of like stuff like Hollywood. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's some rich fucking Hollywood actors out there that they, they're, they're going to be fine. But there's, yeah. a, I, I like a lot of B movies and there's a lot of B actors and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And you know those, these people too. And a lot of directors and pe underground people that don't have the same underground metal, underground movies, everything. Mm -hmm. They're just these people that are just struggling just like a average person yep. and they've been put out of work this yep. put us out of work completely yep. so like you said anything you can do to help support any entertainment especially underground entertainment is always the best we you know that's the thing about underground we are strong we're a strong yeah. fucking unit of people I mean, I've been doing this for 35 years. I'm still doing it. I'm underground. I'm not doing it to be a rock star. I'm doing it because I love it. Love it. And there's so many of us that have that passion for it. We love it. And we really need, this is the time to support it the most. Right. And support it doesn't mean, yes, it doesn't mean to buy it always. Support it in any possible way you can. Support it by recognizing and, and, and just, you know, and believe it or not, that's going to help. You just saying something cool to somebody, you might not yeah. think, hey, man, he don't need to be recognized because everybody recognize, everybody knows who that is. If you've got a favorite singer or a favorite guitar player or a favorite whatever drummer, let them know, yeah. especially right now. Just tell, reach out and say, hey, man, and you know what? Your fucking album, whatever it was, it fucking got me through some cool times. It's fucking a brutal album. Yeah. I love it. Let them know. You don't know how bad they might be feeling right now. You don't know what bad day they woke up and said, fuck, man, I got nothing to eat. My fucking, I'm about to get kicked out. My landlord's going to kick me out. You just making a comment during that day, that might just make them feel better. That yeah. might make them say, fuck, yeah, man, I, I got, you know, this makes me feel good. I got I, another, you know, this is cool, man. Yep. That, that's, that kind of shit helps, man. Believe it or not, just that little bit, it helps. Totally. Totally does, man. And, and we have to do this. Like you said, we're... We're an underground. There's it, it. It's all. It's not. It's niche to a degree, and we need each other to keep this shit going during these hard times. Cause uh, we all we all try to do as as much as we can before all this bullshit started kicking in. You know, to help support and everything like that. But now it's the most crucial time, and it's almost like a like a, like like it's, it's almost like a telethon thing going on right now where we need we yeah. need we need to do this we need to call people up we need to email everybody and, and like you said man hey man i appreciate what you did and if i can just you know maybe buy a sticker or just buy a patch or you know a, just it's like it's an ep or something like that like anything helps man and and we all need that positive attitude cuz we're all getting dragged through the mud yeah it's it, it's yeah i mean especially with the way that I, I'm not going to get political. I'm nope. not a political person. I'm not a political person. I'm not a religious person. So you're never going to get that out of me. But I do see what's going on. I'm not lying to see what's going on in the United right. States. I do see. I do see the the agendas on on all ends. And trust me, like I said, I'm not political. And if if anything, if anybody could say anything, and, and you're not going to find too many people that will actually admit this, and, and it's kind of hard to say. If anything, because I guess this is the old punker in me. If I would say I'm anything, I'm an intellectual anarchist. Right. <laughs> and I say I say that because I says like I don't I'm not an anarchist where I'm going to go blow up a government building, but I'm an intellectual anarchist where I'm going to blow up those ideas of whatever right. political agenda you have. Yep. Because um, and it's the same thing. I'm I'm an atheist. I don't have any religious uh, thing. I, I do not believe in in anything. Um, other than science and, uh, you know, uh, the Big Bang Theory, I guess, if anything, um, and the universe and Cthulhu. Right. Or Cthulhu. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Cam, I want to I wanna talk more about, we, we still have lots to talk about, but we've already been chatting for almost two hours and a bit now. Uh, okay. And I think we're going to do a part two because we haven't even touched movies yet. 
We haven't touched the. Yes, I know. We haven't touched any of that. I mean, we can go on forever spitballing all this stuff, and literally, like, look at it. We've already almost gone like three hours into this, and we haven't even really touched the iceberg yet. <laughs> I know. It's, it's hilarious. I, know. I love it. So let's let's do but, a part. I mean, I mean, you're wearing you're wearing the shirt right there. I will tell you this right now, real quick, real fast. You're wearing Fulci, and and Fulci is such an integral part of the early death metal scene. I could, the, the, and especially the three films, man, right off the bat, City of the Living Dead or, or Gates of Hell, yep. The Beyond, yep. The Beyond is just fucking, and, and House by the Cemetery. Yep. Those three films alone have influenced so fucking many early death metal bands and still influence bands to this day. To this day. I mean, it's amazing. And, uh, Yes, Fulci is 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 that's the it, I mean that's just on uh, that's just again that's just the tip of one iceberg. Yeah. I mean literally and of course Evil Dead. I mean Evil Dead is it's such an influence on so many levels. And of course the Exorcist. I mean Killjoy and the Exorcist it, 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 that's like staple man. Yeah, I mean, totally. He, he, <laughs> he literally told me that he got his idea to, for vocals from the exorcist i mean that's literally what he told me he said he said he got the idea to sing the way he does from the movie the exorcist and, and he, I, I told him yeah i, said, it, I got he, the idea of how to growl from rottweilers from uh, the omen but i mean <laughs> that's literally i was exposed to rottweilers for the first time ever in my life from the movie the omen and i fucking feared those dogs yeah. until i met one <laughs> i was literally afraid of those things I was like, that's the fucking most evilest creature on the planet. And it's because they own it. Right, right on, right on. So if we can support, like I said, you can go check out Cam Lee on his band camp. Uh, order everything through there. And he loves social media. We all do because this is how we connect and stay a, 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 a part of this scene. So, you know, he's always around. If you want to, you know, reach out, say, hey, buy some stuff. Uh, anything we can do to help out each other is uh, is what we got to do, man. So I want to thank you very much for hanging out. And like I said, man, we, we, we haven't even touched the iceberg on even just movies itself, which I yeah, mean, I which both of us were fucking fanatics over. So <laughs> lots to talk yes. about, lots to talk about. Um so thank you very much, Cam, man. I, I really, really appreciate it. And it's finally awesome to connect and actually talk instead of just, yes, you know, man. instead of just the emailing all the time. <laughs> right. So all right. awesome. Let's do it. And uh, like I said, man, we're going to do another, we're going to do a part two, but we're going to fucking talk about movies because we're both just ridiculous over movies. So uh, yeah, man, support, do what you can. Thank you very much, Cam. And uh, like I like I said, man, let's keep in chat, keep in touch, and we're gonna do this again very soon. Awesome. Thank you very much, bro. Take it easy. Talk soon. All right, man. All right. Ciao. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> Kick ass. Kick ass. Oh, all this is coming up here. Oh, yeah. Lots of work. Lots of work. Oh, man. I want to sit there and chat more. I want to sit there and chat. But uh, I got to I gotta go to the bathroom. I got to. I got I got asthma. I, uh, I'll admit it. I got asthma. It fucking sucks ass. So uh, I got to go use my puffer. And uh, I wanted to make a part two to this uh, Camly anyways because... There's just so much more to talk about, man. And he's such a rad dude. And it's fucking, it's just, it's fun. So thank you very much, everybody, for hanging out. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to do any interviews next week. Uh, I'm trying to spread some time out. And uh, I got some other projects. I'm actually writing a script right now. Um, I'm just working on some things in the background that I need to focus on. And uh, yeah, man. So thanks a lot, everybody. And like I said, and like Cam says also, man, share, support, like, whatever you can do, man, to, you know, to, to talk to the arts, talk to the bands, talk to the production companies, talk to the movie guys, talk to the actors, everybody. So uh, appreciate it. And thank you once again. 
and we'll see you soon. We're going to keep you updated. Just, you know, just hang out on our Facebook. Always something going on. Always chatting about this and that and uh, promoting what we can. So fucking right, man. Cam Lee, fucking awesome. Such a pleasure. Thanks a lot, everybody. Fulci lives.